turned around to chase him. That's the thing we got today. Remind me to turn my phone back on after the meeting. Awesome it is. Never do that. Yes. Try to reach me. Oh no. Like, like to call the uh, August 28th school committee meeting to order. Uh, trust everybody had a good first day. Uh, started bright and early this morning. So tonight uh, we'll have to start with uh, public input, and then we'll have uh, the consent agenda followed by the uh, introduction of the new teachers. Is there anything, any public input for anything that's not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, do I have a motion for the we'll Move to approve. Hold on. Oh. Let's see if, if anyone wants anything off. Oh, um, I'd like to see if anyone on the board wants anything removed from the consent agenda. Yeah, I'd like to remove the $5,000 anonymous donation from the consent agenda for a separate discussion. For PD. Is there a second? Consent agenda as amended with the anonymous donation for 5000 to be used to support professional development removed from the consent agenda. All those in favor? Yeah, I just have a question for the superintendent. One of the, just kind of a housekeeping question, but I just want to assure the public when, when we get sizable donations, particularly anonymously, that, um, and I recognize obviously that whoever gave this money wants to do so anonymously. I, what assurances can you give us and the public that, that this donation doesn't come with any strings attached, doesn't present any, present any potential conflict of interest for the district in accepting this, this amount of money for professional development? The donation has to be used for professional development. So okay. it goes into the district gift account. When a school committee accepts a donation um, for an amount of money that's for the good of the district, um, like this, uh, it goes into the district gift account and it's earmarked for the program. So when we have professional development activities during the year, this is what the funding would be used for. Did it, I noticed that it didn't appear to come with a, a separate letter. Usually these gifts come with some kind of a separate letter. Not the anonymous ones, no. And were there any requirements attached to the spending of that money by you or the district? No, it's for professional development. However you see fit in your Correct. capacity as superintendent. No requirements that it be for one thing or another. Just Correct. Like, here's the money, spend it within <coughs> professional development as you think best. Yes, I mean, we'll be using it to move forward our district improvement plan. That's the goal That's the goal of it. All right, so I just wanted to have people understand that. So thank you. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. So I think it would be good for us to um, approve this item. If we can accept the anonymous donation of $5,000 to be used to support professional development as directed by Superintendent Doherty. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Five, seven. Dr. Doherty, uh, one of our favorite nights of the yes, year. Yes, it is. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, so I would um, uh, like to welcome everyone. Uh, this We've had an exciting day. Um, first day back for teachers. We started off with an opening session uh, with the entire district, all staff, um, and then uh, teachers and other staff, they went back to uh, their buildings after a couple meetings, and um, then we're working with the building principals and other staff in their buildings for the rest of the day. Um, they'll be doing similar things tomorrow, um, getting ready for the first day of school on Wednesday. Um, last week, all of the people that you see here, and maybe a couple more, were part of the induction program for new teachers. There is an agenda that I believe is in your packet. Yes, it is. Um, for our educator induction program, you can see the agenda there. Those are the types of activities that our new teachers um, went through last uh, week. Um, really trying to give them a flavor of the Reading Public Schools, what the Reading Public Schools 
stands for, what it's all about. Um, also went over some of the more of the legal things and, and other areas that, that we need to uh, discuss with, with teachers in general, but with new teachers as well. I had the opportunity, uh, along with the Reading Police Department, to do the ALICE training with the new teachers and to go over educator evaluation. Um, and I know that Craig and Carolyn as well did sessions um, in different areas, as you can see in the agenda. So um, we have a great group of new teachers. Um, in the packet is a list of those, those teachers. Um, what we're going to do this evening is I'm going to have uh, each building principal come up and call up the teachers. And we have two, I believe, photographers here tonight, or one? Two photographers that are going to be taking pictures as the building principal is calling the teachers up at the end. So if everyone would just remain standing until the picture is taken for that particular building. Okay. So we're going to start out first because she's going to model what it's supposed to look like, the Wood End Elementary School. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to add, as Joanne is coming up here, um, that recently Joanne King just completed and defended her dissertation, and now she is Dr. Joanne And that's why she's going first tonight. <laughs> W and we're always laughing. <laughs> happy to do with it. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the amazing um, new staff at Wood End Elementary School. So Lori Abelson, Jessica Talbot, Gabriella Massey, and Catherine Horan. If you guys come up here, ladies, and take a seat. Kind of stand around. <laughs> First two have to sit. No, no, they don't have to sit. No, we don't want to sit. Stand. <laughs> Let's do like a family photo. <laughs> Perfect. So let me introduce our amazing staff. So thank you for having us tonight. We're very excited to be here. Very excited to have completed our first day together. So I'm going to start with um, Gabriella Massey, who is our new special education teacher in our learning center. She um, completed her bachelor's in early childhood from Endicott and then her master's in special education at Merrimack. She also did her student teaching at Killam. So we're very excited to have her, um, after spending a year in Haverhill, welcome her back to Reading and have her in our learning center. So welcome to Gabby. Next we have Catherine Huron, who um, she's actually been a paraeducator at Wooden since 2011, I think. Um, and she completed her master's in special education through Leslie um, just this past spring, did her student teaching. So we're very excited to have her join the special education team as our um, one of our Crossroads teachers in our Crossroads program. So welcome to Catherine. Then we have um, Lori Abelson, who is our new reading specialist. Um, very excited to have Lori. She completed her bachelor's at UMass Amherst and then her master's program um, at Simmons and then completed her reading specialist certification at Salem State. She's coming to us um, after 15 years in Brockton. She was actually commuting this past year from Nashua to Brockton. She's since moved to Nashua, so we were lucky enough to have her join the Wood End team as our reading specialist. And also from Brockton, I know they're very sad today that we've taken <laughs> two of their best teachers, but we have Jessica Talbot, who's joining us um, as our grade three classroom teacher. She completed her bachelor's and her master's at Stonehill, and then just completed um, and she majored, double major, elementary education in Spanish. And she worked in Brockton as a grade three teacher for four years. And she just completed her master's um, as a reading specialist. Um, so she is also joining us as a grade three classroom teacher. So I'd like to welcome. Thank you. <laughs> How was the modeling? Not Excellent. bad? Excellent. <laughs> We'd like to now have Heather Leonard, the principal of Barrows Elementary School, come up and introduce her staff. Good evening, Dr. Doherty, Chair Robinson, school committee. Thank you for having us here this evening. It was not that long ago that we were here celebrating some of our milestones of our staff, so it's exciting to be welcoming our newest staff members, and I look forward to that, that day where we can be celebrating those milestones with them as well. 
Um, I'm honored to be able to introduce the new members of our Barrows Elementary School staff. Um, first is Vittoria Penna. Vittoria Penna has actually been at Barrows for three years. She was hired as a general education tutor, supporting our students. Did a phenomenal job and actually was um, in the position of a long-term substitute for first grade for a couple of years and has now joined our staff as a teacher in our second grade classroom. And Vittoria is actually in the process of getting her master's degree, so she's bringing all sorts of great new knowledge and research to our building, so we love to have her here for that. Um, next is Randy Dittman. Randy is joining us as a special education teacher in our learning center. Uh, Randy has a new four-month-old, right? Five-month-old. Five-month-old uh, at home, and Randy is joining us. He is a veteran, and after his service, he went back and he's got his degree in special education, and after some uh, student teaching and some long-term substitutes. We're excited to have him here and joining us, supporting primarily our second and third grade students in special ed. We have Joan Duffy next. Uh, Joan has been in education for over 20 years with a great deal of experience in kindergarten through fifth grade special education. And she has a particular depth of knowledge in the area of supporting reading and reading disabilities. Uh, and Joan has Two, we said we were sharing our little ones, and so she has two grown little ones, we'll say. Um, but we're really excited to have Joan join the staff and bring her depth of experience and knowledge to Barrows. So, welcome, Joan. And she'll be working in our learning center, supporting primarily our kindergarten and first grade special education needs. And finally, uh, we have Katie Jones. Katie's actually joining us from California, and she asked me on Friday, she said, so you don't do earthquake drills? And we said, no. Uh, but we did discuss the need for practicing driving in the snow, so yes. we're trading one for the other. Um, so Katie's coming to us from the West Coast, where she has experience as a special, um, as a science and technology educator, and also as a fifth grade classroom teacher, which works out beautifully as she'll be our science teacher and our fifth grade team joining and supporting in the general education classroom setting. Uh, she also moved from the West Coast with her two littles at home, so we have a wonderful growing family at Barrows and we're really glad to welcome them. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Heather. I'd like to have Julia Hendricks now come up, principal at Birch Meadow and her staff. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. We have one new teacher at Birch Meadow this year. Caitlin Coy has joined us as a fifth grade teacher. She has a undergraduate and master's degree in education from the University of New Hampshire spent a year teaching in Bangkok, Thailand, and has worked both as a paraeducator and a long-term substitute in the Tewksbury Public Schools before joining us at Birch, and we are really happy to have her. Thank you. And our next school um, from the Killam Elementary School, Sarah Levesque, principal, is going to introduce her staff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm excited to introduce you to three of our newest staff members. Uh, joining us in our Learning Center program, we have Elizabeth Kelly. Um, she is coming from an um, integrated third grade classroom in Haverhill, so we're excited to have her join us and bring that um, aspect, understanding both the special education side as well as the general education side and helping us grow in our expertise in that area. So we're excited to welcome her this year. We also have Stacy Burke, who is going to be joining us as a teacher in our therapeutic support program. Um, when I met Stacy, she said, these are my kids, I get them, I know them, and we said, all right, come and join us. So Stacy's joining us in that program. She comes to us from um, work both in Michigan as well as in the Salem Public Schools. Uh, she was in Michigan the last few years, so we're excited to invite her back to Massachusetts and have her come back home and meet everyone here. And we have Kamika Reese, who's joining us as a fourth grade teacher. Kamika was in Missouri as a STEAM teacher, teaching K to eight, so we're excited to tap into that knowledge and um, understand more of the science and engineering in an elementary program. Uh, and she's, we're stealing her from the Lexington Public School. She's coming to us with um, a wide range of knowledge, both from first through fifth grade, so we're excited to have her join us on the fourth grade teaching team. We also have Erica Bourne, who couldn't be here this evening. She's uh, actually a member of the RISE Preschool, but is joining us again at Killam as a kindergarten teacher for a one-year leave of absence position. Erica was at Killam uh, prior to teaching at RISE as a fourth and fifth grade teacher, so we're excited to welcome her back for a year. So thank you, everyone, and welcome to the team.
Thank you, Sarah. And our final elementary school, uh, I introduced to you uh, Lisa Marie in July, so Lisa Marie Ippolito, um, our newest principal at the um, Joshua Eaton, and she's going to introduce her staff. My staff, come on up and join me. Uh, thank you for having us this evening. I just want to say it's my first day on the official job. Um, was wonderful. I have a wonderful staff and um, some great additions to that staff. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce you to Pam um, Doyle. And Pam is our new learning center teacher. Uh, she received her master's degree from American International College in the area of reading. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Massachusetts in elementary education with a minor in psychology. And she's also Orton Gillingham trained and um, Wilson um, has used Wilson reading before. So welcome, Pam. And then we have Michelle Lipkin. She's our new school psychologist. And I said to her earlier today, I feel like she's been here forever because we hired her back in June and she's been around so much to uh, learn about our students. So Michelle is a graduate of Northeastern University with a master's in school psychology. She also has been work, she also worked at McLean Hospital in a bio um, psychiatry department, and she's also very well versed in supporting students um, for their social and emotional needs. We welcome Michelle, and then I'd like to introduce you to Donald D J Cook. He's our new third grade teacher at Joshua Eaton. Donald is a graduate of Merrimack College. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in science and child family and community studies. So welcome to Donald. And then last but finally not least is Phyllis Green. Um, Phyllis and I actually go back a little bit. Um, she uh, worked in Wilmington Public Schools and um, has an excellent reputation as a special education teacher. She's our new um, language-based teacher as part of the Bridge Program. And uh, she has a master's degree in special education, a, a bachelor's degree in psychology and cognitive development as well as her Wilson reading certification. So welcome to Joshua Eaton, and thank you for having us. Next up, uh, Sarah Machant, the principal of Coolidge Middle School. Good evening, and thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with these four wonderful women who will be joining the Coolidge staff this year. I'd like to start in, by introducing Amy Beth Gallino, who is joining us, and I'm so excited to have her. <laughs> she'll, she'll be teaching French on our French team, and um, she completed her master's degree two years ago at Fitchburg State University with a degree in curriculum and teaching. She's taught for 16 years, students from the age of five to 21, and not only has she taught French, but she has also lived in France and taught English. So. Um, she brings that to us, which is an, a neat um, way of looking at the language. And the day she learned that she was going to make Boston Marathon and run in the Boston Marathon was also the same day she got the job at Coolidge. So she relates both things very well in her head, which is very <laughs> good, better her than me. Um, next, I would like to introduce Molly McIver. Um, Molly received her undergraduate degree in biology education from East Central University in Oklahoma, Ada, Oklahoma, and she's also from Oklahoma, so that we don't get to introduce too many people from Oklahoma here, which is <laughs> exciting. Um, she taught one year at a private school in Oklahoma and then moved to Cumberland, Rhode Island, where she taught for two years, eighth grade science, and is now going to be teaching sixth grade science at Coolidge, so welcome to Molly. And her, I like adding a personal fact, she loves to play volleyball, played competitively for 15 years and still enjoys playing on teams as well. Next, we have Selma Walsh, who will also be teaching sixth grade science. She earned her master's degree in education from Leslie University, and prior to that, her bachelor's degree in therapeutic recreation from Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. She was a science integration specialist in Salem, Massachusetts, at Witchcraft Heights Elementary School for eight years. Um, she currently resides in Boxford, and over the years, this is pretty neat, she's volunteered to teach science at the Museum of Science, as well as the Beverly School for the Deaf and Perkins School for the Blind. So really a lot of diversity in her teaching, and we welcome Selma as well. And lastly, but not least, we have Rachel Herman, our school psychologist, who has just received her master's of school psychology from UMass Boston. She did her internship in Brookline in Boston, and we're excited that she's starting her career off with us at Coolidge. 
and um, she's from Miami, Florida, so has that lucky opportunity to get back to the warm in the winter, and um, in her free time loves to dance and to spend time outdoors. And I did want to speak on behalf of my new assistant principal, Brianne Caro, who would have loved to be here tonight and had a prior commitment and really wanted me to say that she can't wait to meet all of you and to be here at a future opportunity. Um, she's joining us from Wilmington, where she's been a reading specialist for nine years, and she has her degree in literacy, special education, and um, elementary education, and she went to Syracuse University for her degrees, both her um, undergraduate and her master's, and she's also been a varsity basketball and track coach at Wilmington, and even has threatened to come back to your next meeting to introduce herself, so you will see her <laughs> soon enough, but um, it's a pleasure. We're excited to have all of our new staff. And Thank you for the opportunity tonight. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to have Ricky Shanklin come up now, the principal at Parker Middle School, and introduce her staff. Thank you for this opportunity to brag about our new staff. Um, we, had a, we had a great day today, nice, um, probably long day for these guys, taking a lot of information in, but since we've hired them, they've all been in and out of the school and familiar, so um, today's just another day for them, probably. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with um, Rachel Weeks. She's our new special education math teacher. She um, received her master's in special education at Merrimack College and her undergraduate degree in mathematics from UMass Amherst. She'll be co-teaching grade eight math and teaching grades six and seven math classes as well. And she's an avid baker and a cook. Um, Kathleen Schmalski, she's um, otherwise known as Kate. She um, resides in Reading and she's our new school nurse. She received her nursing degree from UMass Amherst and has been a substitute nurse for Reading Public Schools for over six years, um, and which is comforting. She knows a lot of the families and I know that um, some of the families that she's already been reaching out to feel also feel comforted that she's, she knows the system and, and already knows some of our kids. Um, she's most recently been working as an RN at both Winchester and Newton Wellesley Hospitals in maternal child care. Um, so welcome. Rach, um, sorry, Lisa Jobes, she's our new grade eight French and Spanish teacher. She received her undergraduate degree in both French and Spanish from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and completed her graduate degree in education from the University of Michigan as well. She's coming, us, coming to us from Wakefield and she resides in North Reading. She's also, um, in her spare time, the director of the North Reading Moms and Tots and leads a story time group called My Little Dumpling. Bonsoir. <laughs> so thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, Adam Bacher, principal of the high school, is now going to introduce his staff. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our newest staff. I'll start off with Laura Davis. Laura Davis is uh, joining our visual and performing arts department as our brand new media literacy and video production teacher, courtesy of RCTV. And you saw the newest facility. So excited to have her. Uh, Laura is from Andover and attended Gordon College, where she studied communications with a focus on film. Uh, following college, Laura worked as the programming coordinator at RCTV while studying at UMass Boston receive her master's in education and her license in moderate disabilities. For the past three years, she worked for the Wayland Public Schools as a special education teaching assistant. So we welcome Laura. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Megan Janger. Megan joins Reading High School as a Spanish teacher. Uh, she currently lives in Arlington and attended Boston College, where she earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Spanish, as well as a Master's of Education in Education Media. Megan brings nearly 20 years of experience as a Spanish teacher, including advanced placement Spanish, and she worked previously at Whitman Hanson Regional High School, as well as Swampskit and uh, Marist School in Atlanta, Georgia. So we welcome Megan. Next, I'd like to introduce Alex Panchik. Alex works, uh, joins the science department as a chemistry teacher. He's a graduate of SUNY Binghamton, not Buffalo, uh, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in Tufts University, where he earned his Master's of Science in Environmental Engineering. Alex also served in the U.S. Peace Corps in Cameroon and comes to Reading most recently from the Boston Public Schools. Actually, he and I worked together for a year in uh, South Boston, where he's been teaching chemistry and environmental science for the past 11 years. 
Prior to teaching, Alex worked as an environmental engineering consultant for almost 20 years. So we're excited to have Alex. Welcome. Next, I'd like, like to introduce Bill Chevry. Uh, Bill Chevry joins the science department as a physics teacher, currently lives in Marblehead, and is a graduate of UMass Amherst, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and Endicott College, where he earned his Master's of Education in Organizational Management. He's happy to be returning to the classroom after working as a school administrator <laughs> uh, for the past 10 years <laughs> in both Salem and Malden. Uh, prior to his years in administration, Bill taught middle school science and later high school physics in Bedford and in Marblehead. And uh, last but least, Natty Smith, I'd like to welcome him to, is joining the English department at the high school. Natty's a resident of Cambridge and holds a Bachelor of Arts uh, from Middlebury College and a Master's of Arts degree from, uh, excuse me, a Bachelor of Arts from Middlebury and a Master's from Tufts. Over the past four years, he has taught in both Somerville and Salem High School working with freshmen to strengthen their writing and reading skills and was also the advisor, advisor to the Creative Writing Club. On a personal note, I'd like to congratulate Natty, uh, who has just become a newlywed this past weekend. <laughs> and lastly, uh, Jamie Benger was not able to join us. She's joining our Special Education Department and Learning Center and will also provide literacy instruction for some of our most struggling students. Jamie is from Methuen and attended Westfield State University, where she obtained a bachelor's degree in special education and then received her master's degree from Salem State University in special ed. For the past nine years, Jamie has worked for the Pentucket uh, Regional School District, first as a paraprofessional, and then after she obtained her license in moderate disabilities as a special education teacher. So we welcome Jamie. And welcome again to all our new staff. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to have Carolyn Wilson now introduce our two newest special education. <coughs> oh. Kelly's going to then, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to have Kelly and Melissa join me. Uh, so Kelly Rosbick is joining us as our new RISE preschool director. Many of you know her from her time as a team chair. So she had a tenure of four years as a team chair. I think she's been at almost every elementary school in Reading. Um, Kelly is, has her bachelor's from Kent State University. She has a master's in school administration from American International College. She taught special education for 13 years prior to becoming a um, team chair and we welcome her as the RISE Preschool Director. And Melissa Forbes, she has 14 years of experience working um, in special education in the Newton Public Schools. She's joining us as the team chair for the high school. She'll be paired with Adam Blaustein for our two team chair positions. Melissa has her bachelor's from Quinnipiac College. She also has two masters, one in education from Cambridge College and a second master's in educational leadership from Endicott. And we're excited to have Melissa join us at the high school. Now Kelly's gonna introduce um, Anne-Marie um, McGrath, uh, she wasn't able to join us here tonight, but she is our new uh, RISE preschool teacher, uh, three days a week at, at our high school program. She has a bachelor's degree from the University of New Hampshire, a uh, master's degree in the, uh, UMass Boston. She um, has 25 years of teaching experience. Her last uh, experiences were, um, she was an assistant director of preschool for the tall, Tall Spire Nursery School, and she worked in the Wakefield Integrated Preschool. And that's this year's group. Well, wel welcome. <laughs> Another round of applause. And welcome, everyone, and, and, and you know, we're thankful and, and very happy that you're here. And, Thank you. Yes. I just um, wanted to make one quick comment. I started adding up the master's degrees and I stopped by, I got to 25, but I know that wasn't everybody and I'm just incredibly impressed um, with you know, all of your expertise. I didn't mean to try to add up all the years of experience, uh, but one of those, thank you. And, and just um, put that out there and honor that and hold that up. 
um, because that's a tremendous amount of work um, that you guys do to put your life's work into our community's children. And I really appreciate that. Um, I'm just completely awed at um, of all of that. Maybe John will add up the stats at some point, but uh, <laughs> I'm just very impressed and very thankful that you're all here. And we look forward to really, I think I heard a diversity of backgrounds, um, different parts of the country, different experiences in the world. And I think that that diversity, bringing that diversity to bear in, in innovating <clears throat> to the best extent that we can in this district, um, given the, the resources that we have, is uh, something that will really make the year very fruitful for all of you and all of our students. And um, I'm excited about that opportunity, so. Wow, kudos. Don't scare them off. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to quickly also say, um, as liaison to the CPAC, I was very impressed and thrilled to, to hear about all the different experiences that people have, but also a lot of people who have special experience with reading, with the challenges involved with reading, and I think it really shows um, it's great that you're here, and it also shows that people were listening to the parents that were expressing their concerns. So I foresee great things. This is the year. I'll just say thank you for coming here tonight. It's a long day for all of you, and I know it's probably a long week of training and getting up to speed, so we really appreciate you making the effort to come here in person and meet us, and thank you. And um, I'd just like to say, from someone who's been an, uh, an educator in the Reading Public Schools for 30 years, um, I just want to welcome you to a great school district and a great community. I'm confident that you'll enjoy the students as well as the parent support, so good luck. Thank you. Take a two minute uh, recess. <laughs>
the meeting back to order and I guess at this point we'll go yeah go into reports sure. um, Mario you got two more days until you get to go back um, you, get any, <laughs> any reports? you have anything or? <laughs> not yet all sports trouts are happening <clears throat> just starting up yeah Uh, no, I think our first meeting, well, the first meeting I'll attend is uh, Thursday for uh, ACASA. Okay. Uh, for selectmen's meeting, um, I was president of the meeting of selectmen, and uh, Elaine's going to give the update for that. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so I, I'd like to just give an update and read a statement um, that the uh, there was an executive session last week that uh, was attended by... Um, and with the doctor and I, as well as the Dr. Doherty, um, Ms. Dowd. Um, was that a, from our staff? Yes. Uh, yes. And then uh, the Board of Selectmen, Town Manager, some of the um, public safety staff, and Library Board. Director of Facilities. Also. Director of Facilities, um, Joe Huggins and uh, the Library Board of Trustees. So at the April 2016 town meeting, members of town meeting approved $125,000 for the purpose of undertaking a comprehensive and thorough study of building security for our town and school buildings. As a result of that appropriation, the firm TRC Solutions was hired to complete a physical and operational study of our facilities and security practices. For the past calendar year, members of the firm have met with school, municipal, and public safety officials, as well as reviewed all of our facilities. Last week, members of the Board of Selectmen, School Committee, Library Board of Trustees, and Municipal and School Officials met in executive session to hear an update from the consultant and determine next steps in the process. Over the next few months, the town manager, superintendent, police chief, and other officials will design a plan for town meeting to consider regarding a capital request for implementation of the plan and the projected ongoing operational budget in impact. And just so folks understand, um, all of us agreed um, this state, uh, B Barry Berman was presiding over the selectmen's meeting at that meeting, and he will be reading a similar statement um, at the selectmen's meeting tomorrow night. And also the library board of trustees will at their next give a meeting. similar. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I have just, um, I had one other, oh no, John, you're gonna do the, Oh, wait, I have a comment to make, but I think John's going to do his report. So I'll wait. Uh, and just one other quick thing. Reco September is um, recovery month. Um, so there's a lot of different events going on that are organized through the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. Um, one, I know, one in the middle of the month is sort of a breakfast with the Chamber of Commerce and an opportunity for local business people to um, <clears throat> meet with members of the RACASA board and the executive director and our um, uh, social worker or uh, clinical, um, Julianne, I don't know her title, sorry about that. And uh, there's also a candlelight vigil that will be held um, here for the entire community. Actually, it's multi-community vigil. And then on, um, that's the last week of September, at our annual meeting, Dr. Ruth Pody is going to be speaking, and um, is that right, at the very end of the month? Yes, at the end of October. Oh, is that October? Uh, yeah, the end of October. Sorry. Um, hold on. Let me get the date. Uh, okay, I have September 28th. Oh, I'm sorry. It's part of the annual meeting. You're right. Annual sorry. meeting. Okay, and the candlelight vigil is the 26th, and Dr. Pody is the 28th. And um, she's done a huge amount of research in the, with regard to substance abuse and specifically marijuana. Um, and um, anyway, I think she's um, renowned. I hope we get a great turnout for, for that um, presentation. So I think that's it for, for CASA. Dr. Dox. Um, I have a couple of reports. I'm gonna give just a brief for the um, CPAC, Special Education Parent Advisory Committee. And I know that um, Mrs. Wilson will continue that. One, um, just to be aware and look for a flyer that will um, tell people about the CPAC and invite everyone to um, participate. And then also they are still looking for an education, sorry, an election coordinator. And that is a very short term um, position with not a ton of homework or anything else. 
but it's necessary in order to conduct the elections for the board. So if you're interested in a little role that's very important with not a lot of work, please think about um, volunteering for that. Um, okay, the Human Relations Advisory Committee, our next meeting is September 7th. We've been working on, over the summer, we've been working on the restructuring of our committee. We're going to have a booth at the town fair. Please come see us. We're also going to be hosting the um, town response committee. There's going to be a name for that, but stay tuned. Um, and I just heard that the Board of Selectmen will be considering the sunsetting of our committee on Tuesday night at 9.45, and the, they're considering um, giving it an extension until December 1st. Um, so that's that. And I just wanted to thank everybody who supported and came to the Reading Friends of Metco barbecue and pool party. Mm -hmm. The PTOs paid for the food this time, this year, and we had over 150 people come. Thank you to all of the staff that came, all of the families that came. If you weren't able to come, it's completely understandable. It's in the middle of the summer. Um, but we are going to have another event towards Boston on October 28th. So stay tuned for information about that. It would be wonderful to have you involved. There are, um, there's lots of scheming going on. Also, we'll be announcing the, um, the Friends of Metco um, Chorus for the Martin Luther King Day celebration. So if your children are interested in that, stay tuned. We'd love to have them. And um, that, I think, is it for me. This is the year. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna, we're going to do a combined report this evening, um, really summarizing what has been going on this summer. Um, it's actually, it's been 71 days from the last day of school until this week. <laughs> Who's counting? Um, <laughs> But a lot has been going on during those 71 days, and there were, there were there's two things going on, and two types of things going on. One is things that need to happen during the summer, but then things are planning for what's going to be happening this year. And there's been a lot of both happening. Um, so what I want to talk about first is I want to address the SWAT sticker issues that um, I did report out in July, but I want to talk about some of the things that we've been doing um, behind the scenes as a school district um, to address that unfortunate, those series of unfortunate situations. Um, Craig is, and Carolyn are going to talk about learning and teaching and student services. Um, I want to give an update on our, all of our capital projects and summer work that's been done in our buildings, um, and including our technology summer work. And then I want to give you a brief update on what's been going on with the FY18 budget and some of the adjustments that we've had to make. So first I wanna talk about um, the SWAT sticker incidents. So if you remember, um, and we've, we've brought this up several times at, at meetings and uh, have had statements go out uh, regarding the different issues. We've had some issues in um, April and May. We also most recently had uh, a uh, graffiti, SWAT sticker graffiti, um, la a week ago Monday um, on the fence up here on, on Oakland Road. Uh, it was reported by a community member over the weekend. Um, police investigated it on uh, Monday morning, um, and then we were notified right after that, that and we sent something out to the community um, by, by mid-afternoon. These. Uh, this incident is still under investigation. We did receive um, uh, some, con uh, some questions from the media uh, on Friday afternoon. Uh, they had picked it up uh, on the patch. And so uh, the Boston Globe, Channel 4, and Channel 10 um, did call me and ask me a series of questions. Uh, the Boston Globe and Channel 4 uh, did it by telephone. Channel 10 actually came out on site and did an interview. Uh, the Boston Globe article you have in front of you, um, that was uh, published on Saturday, um, both online and in the 
uh, paper version of, of the paper. Um, so prior to Monday's incident, uh, there's been a lot been going on behind the scenes. And one of the things that I wanted to learn more about is how can we respond better as a school district to these um, acts, acts of hate is really what it comes down to. So I met with Rabbi Susan Abramson. Some of this is going to be repetitive, but I, now I think that we're back in the swing of things and there's probably more people watching um, rather than what we were talking you know, during the summer. I, that's why I'm going to repeat some of the things that, that I've talked about in other meetings. I met with Rabbi Susan Abramson in, uh, right after school ended. Actually, it was before school ended um, in June to talk about uh, the response that she had uh, when this similar incidents were happening in Bedford um, four years ago. It's actually a Boston Globe uh, magazine article on how Bedford responded to this and the role that um, town officials, clergy, school uh, superintendent played in that. One of the things that she mentioned is to re was reaching out to the Jewish community. So um, through her help, um, had a meeting, a neighborhood meeting, with about 40 members of the Reading Jewish community. That was in late June. Uh, we felt it was important to have that meeting prior to uh, the summer um, so that we could communicate to members of the community uh, what was going on, updates that we may have, and how we're addressing it. Um, Deputy Chief Clark joined me uh, on that. Uh, he is a member of HRAC. Um, Chief Sagala was on a vacation that week, but I know he would have been there as well. When I, after meeting with the Jewish community, um, I walked away learning a lot more about what really the concerns are and what it, what it represents. And a lot of the parents, uh, a lot of the people in the room had children either go through the Reading Public Schools or currently do have children in the Reading Public Schools. There were two, uh, there were also two, I believe two or maybe three high school students at the meeting as well. And <clears throat> I walked away with a lot of ways that we can do a better job in responding to these incidents. <clears throat> I then subsequently met with a couple other members of that group. Um, one an educator in another community, uh, learning about how um, they address these issues um, in, in, their, in the schools, it was particularly a high school. Got some really good ideas from that, and I'll mention one of the ideas in a minute. Um, we also met, uh, we also brought in the Anti-Defamation League. I reached out to Phil Fogelman, uh, in, and we decided that we were going to start with having a training with our administrators, which actually happened a couple weeks ago, uh, with all of our administrative staff including our principals, assistant principals, team chairs, um, and uh, uh, central office administrators. Uh, assist I said the assistant principal as well. In addition to that, we will be having in each of our uh, three secondary schools a World of Difference Club this year, um, which will include training. Um, I know Mr. Boyman mentioned earlier uh, anonymous donations. We did actually did receive an anonymous donation, um, I think it was in June, or maybe it was earlier than that, that would help fund the student training for a World of Difference Club. Um, and it was specifically earmarked for um, those types of activities. In addition, one of the things that was brought up that's being done in other school districts is a uh, program called the MVP, New England Patriots Anti-Violence Partnership. It's also done through the district, State District Attorney's Office. Um, there are grant opportunities that are available. Um, Mr. Zaya applied for that grant through um, the MIA, received a $3,000 grant that will be um, focused on student training to train all of our um, student uh, captains um, and other uh, student leaders at the high school on how to address the topic of violence. Um, this program specifically targets training to the student leaders in the building with the understanding then that they are going to 
uh, work with their teams, their clubs, their activities um, in promoting an anti-violence um, message. So that will be starting um, in, the next, in the next few weeks. We've also been busy updating our bullying prevention plan. We are in the process of putting the final touches on that. We've put it by our student legal counsel, uh, Michael Joyce, who you've met before. Um, that bullying prevention plan is going to look at it from of a wide variety of uh, lenses, in, which also takes a look at training, both the compliance training that, that it, to making sure that we're following the right procedures um, with bullying issues, but also how the ongoing training and how staff respond immediately when there is a uh, potential bullying issue. We, uh, so the bullying prevention plan is, is very comprehensive and it includes a lot of the other things that I'm talking about. Tonight you are going to have the first reading of the religious accommodation plan. Um, I put together a committee this summer of uh, teachers, administrators, parents to review the plan and what you see this evening is their recommended changes um, which you will have a first reading and I believe in the packet you have both the red line version and the um, what it would look like if without the red line so you could see both. There is a senior elective at the high school that actually is getting uh, revised a little bit. Uh, it used to be, uh, it's now called Diverse Voices. Actually, Dr. Doxer and I went and observed one of these classes last year. Uh, it's taught by Leah Richardson and I know other members of the English department. And it really is going to focus on the topics of bullying, microaggressions, hate, um, and how as a school community will be addressing those. Um, so I actually look forward to going and visiting that class again and seeing how um, the curriculum is, is, is changed and, and the impact that's gonna have on students. And then finally, Dr. Doxa mentioned the community planning group um, that is being led by the Reading uh, Clergy Association. Um, Jamie, and I can't remember her last name. Michaels, Michaels. and ATRAC. And ATRAC, thank you. Um, is Reading. leading the group from Jamie Old Stone. South. Old South, yeah. Um, and so we've had, there's been two meetings. One was an initial meeting, but then we had a, a, a subsequent planning meeting a couple weeks ago. The next meeting that is September 5th. Um, but we are going to have a community um, event on October 3rd here at the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, we're still in the stages of planning that. Um, but that will be an event where there will be some updates on what has been happening, but also giving the community uh, a chance to respond. Um, their thoughts and feelings. Um, there's been a lot going on, as you can see, um, in regards to addressing um, these incidents that began last, last April. Chairman Robinson. Yes. Uh, Dr. Wright, I just would like to add um, something from the Globe article, if I could, because um, uh, I know previously Superintendent Scatini would often say, you know, you don't want to don't want to be in the Globe, um, and you really, if you are in the Globe, you like to be able to, um, you know, hope that the the messaging is something that you're providing. But I think that um, uh, it's worth reading and making sure that the community understands. Um, the regional director, Robert Tristan, um, said of, of Reading um, that he commended the Reading community for its response. It's, it was hard to determine whether in this last case whether um, the word no came before or after. But in his comment, the positive thing comes out of it, a pos the positive thing that comes out of it regardless is that somebody saw it, somebody reported it, and the school is being transparent, supportive, and responsible. Um, if you look at the incidents, this is also his perspective, his quote, if you look at the incidents that were reported in the spring and this last one this weekend, this is a committed community that is a united community and we should be applauding them for their commitment in dealing with these issues. In this, he said, in this case, this community is an example for others. And I really want to recognize Dr. Doherty for his incredible leadership with that and for, um, you know, really, and I think the quote was in there that we're going to meet that head on. There's just no place for that kind of hate. And I think most importantly, when you, you know, just hear your update, it's a very well thought out, um, very well designed approach with many different prongs to it that um, involve the students, the community, 
our clergy experts, um, past history of you know other communities. So um, I was feeling like um, there was no need to hold my breath as I was reading the article. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yes. I also wanted to say that um, I'm very excited that the MVP program will be coming here. There are a number of students from our schools and staff who have experienced a conference called Co Courage to Care at the Lincoln Sudbury High School. And um, it was a very exciting experience to talk to. I was able to go to be able to talk to the teachers there and how enthusiastic they were and to watch the students because the students ran the training for the adults and it was really inspiring to feel their passion and their impact on their peers in terms of fighting bullying and educating their peers and drawing them into the positive and kudos to Tom Zaya in the I don't know maybe a month he pulled together applied for that grant and so it's not costing our taxpayers for that we have three thousand dollars that's going to pay for this training um, and that's what I've seen happen and a lot a lot of time I know from personal experience it is through anonymous grants as well anonymous donations um, and I'm very grateful I didn't have a chance to say it after the um, the agenda at the beginning but to all of the people that have contributed donated supported the schools it's this community is amazing, and I'm really proud of it and proud that the Globe captured it. So thank you for everybody's support for these things. Thank you. Can we continue? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to talk about learning and teaching updates, and I'm going to turn this part over to Craig. So I thought I would begin, first of all, by talking a little bit about uh, what we've been doing with our science curriculum. Um, one of the first things that we do when the school year ends is actually wrap up the fiscal year because that doesn't end until the end of June. And as you know, um, last year the community funded $150,000 more for the science curriculum update. So I thought tonight I'd just kind of give you a very quick 30,000 foot view of some of the things that we were purchasing. Um, a little bit later this year we'll give you a little bit more comprehensive look and bring some staff in to show you how some of these things are being used this year. And by the way, I again want to thank our community for continuing to fund that and thank also all of our all of our staff who have been collaborating to explore resources and what we need to do to best align with the new state framework for science, technology, and engineering. Um, so you may remember from our science update last year, we talked about what was happening at the middle level. Um, in seventh and eighth grade last year, we were piloting the STEM scopes curriculum resources, um, and we have gone ahead and moved forward with that for seventh and eighth grade. So this year, that will be fully implemented in seventh grade, and it will be beginning to be integrated also throughout the eighth grade. Um, in grade nine, we have selected the Pearson's Miller and Levine biology curriculum resources. I know the high school staff are very excited. First of all, because it's been a number of years, as you know, since any of our th materials have been updated. But they felt this particular program really would afford us um, tremendous opportunities. They were very impressed with all the additional resources, including digital resources, not only for students, but for staff as well. Um, also last spring, I believe it was, in our science update, we talked about we we're in the process of looking at the K-2 framework you know that we're doing the No Adam program in grades three, four, five um, fully. And we said in last year's update that in grades K through two, our plan was to identify the key focus areas and standards in the framework so that we can ensure that students are getting a good foundation um, before they get into the full time grades three, four, and five, um, even to the point of how we integrate it into the reading, reading selections and things like that. Um, the group of teachers have begun that, and what we had determined is that we are actually going to be using the no Adam material, some of them. We won't be implementing the program fully as we're doing in grades three, four, and five, but we're going to be using some of the teacher resources and selecting some of the key features of that to begin implementing in K through two. So we can give you a more update on that later in the year. We also were able to purchase for grades seven, eight, and nine laptop 
carts for the science and technology standards um, for Coolidge, Parker, and the high school. As you know, uh, many of the standards actually are connected to the technology and engineering, and many of our new resources also will require technology, and so that was uh, something that we were able to do. We are also able to fully update the new, or the physics computer lab, which was really far out of date, and we needed to do that. And we are also able to purchase quite a bit of instructional equipment um, for physics and chemistry at the high school. So there was a big focus on the high school. I was actually just talking with Mary Ann Lynn, the department chair, this afternoon, and we're already beginning to look ahead. Um, basically, what we have left remaining is um, the high school, particularly physics and chemistry resources. But we were able to begin some of that this year. There we go. Um, Dr. Doherty was talking about some of the things that we're doing all summer long, and it's a pretty busy place, obviously. Um, we've had several opportunities for our administrators to receive professional development and to collaborate. Um, we've been continuing some administrator workshops with John Dioria, um, which have been really outstanding. Um, Mr. Dior Dioria talks about what he calls the fractal nature of education, which is essentially how important it is for all leaders in a school district to really be modeling the types of interactions, the learning that we need to happen, the fractal nature, meaning you know, um, each sense part of the community mirrors each other. The, the, the relationship from central office to the building administrators, building administrators to staff, staff to students, and the type of learning, the type of interactions we have really mirror each other. So we've been doing some great workshops with that. Um, several of us from central office had the opportunity to attend the annual state conference for superintendents and central office from the MASS organization, which always has great sessions, um, some great keynote speakers, and also some really important updates on laws and, and regulations and things in our state. We've had several work, um, <coughs> professional development opportunities for staff. My notes here. One was a, actually a week-long course um, called the Diagnosis and Remediation of Learning Problems in Mathematics. That was presented by Professor Mahesh Sharma. So you might re remember uh, Professor Sharma. Um, he's done some work with our district over the last couple of years. He actually gave a parent presentation one night, I think it was the year before last maybe, um, which was an outstanding course. Um, it really helped staff understand how children can begin struggling in mathematics to diagnose sort of the root of that problem and then how best to remediate or intervene with those situations. Um, we were able to collaborate some with another district so there's some other um, staff members from other districts there as well and it was just an outstanding course. Um, I mean I was just looking today's um, the survey that we do with staff often after professional development um, Almost every question on that survey was a four or five, which is pretty much the strongest possible ratings. When it came to the questions about, um, did this provide, um, where's my notes, about things like uh, professional knowledge that I can put to use immediately, or it was key to my professional growth, 100% of the participants rated it a five, which I, you don't see too often. So that was really, really great to see. Um, we also had a couple of workshops that Gene Thompson Grove provided. One was um, called Designing Adult Learning and one Teaching All Kinds of Minds. That's a great opportunity. Jean has also done a lot of work with our district and her sessions get great accolades from staff. Um, other staff from other districts also attended by providing the space for these workshops. We're able to get complimentary slots. So that's a great opportunity for us. The Designing Adult Learning is really great. We had a small group attend that, but that's ideal for teacher leaders, administrators, who really need to understand how we as adults learn, how to present material, how to facilitate um, meetings and professional development and stuff for other staff. And then her teaching all kinds of minds really looks at um, how to better understand um, students through a neurodevelopmental lens, um, the diverse learners that are in all of our classrooms. Um, how to really support their learning, how to create more effective accommodations, 
um, better instruction and so forth. Several of the staff said to her afterwards and then echoed to me that they actually found that uh, workshop, it was three days, I believe it was, um, they said their word was transformational, that the way that they see their work with their students is forever changed. I mean, it really is a powerful workshop. So we're looking forward to doing more of that. Dr. Doherty already mentioned the Anti-Defamation League training, which we thought was outstanding, and we, we, our hope is to continue more of that with even more staff, but our entire administrative team was part of that. Um, he also mentioned the new staff induction, and you looked at the agenda. You know, one of the things that's very heartening for me with that is that not only the substance of the topics, but several of the staff members that were here earlier this evening came up to me afterwards and said such positive things about how, what it reflects about our district. Um, for them to say that out loud, they didn't have to say that, you know, to say, wow, you know, I'm really proud to be a part of the district. We can tell through the topics that you're focusing on what the values are of this district, and I feel like I made a good choice. <laughs> you know, so that was, that's really nice to hear. Um, that included, incorporated in that is the youth mental health first aid training that we've been doing with all of our staff and members of the community, and it's hundreds of people now. I forget how many people we've had. Oh, it's close to a 1,000. Yeah, 1,000 people. Um, and they loved that day. I mean, again, for um, that has consistently gotten high marks from staff. Um, and then I also want to say our extended day, you know, sometimes our community education and extended day staff, sometimes we don't include them, but I mean, that program has grown, as you know. We have. Um, hundreds and hundreds of students in that. They now have 59 staff in all the schools. So they did a number of trainings, including de-escalation, restraint training, first aid, CPR, and extended day orientation. So that was about four, five, six days of training throughout the summer for all of their staff so that they're fully prepared. Um, matter of fact, tonight, and they were also preparing their parent welcome night, which I think is tonight. Yes, yes it is. Yes. <laughs> so they're in another location. Mm -hmm. um, doing that tonight. And then that last bullet also is actually through um, Sandy Gallandrella and our community ed. We're planning the parent university for October. I should have put the date on there. I think October it's October 21st, 21st yep. Saturday. It's a Saturday. Um, and so we're planning some great sessions for that and exploring keynote speakers. I think we've got a great one for that. But that was just sort of to remind me of not only just the PD and all of the work that we're doing, but all the administrators, leaders, directors, really preparing all the things for the year ahead. Um, things for the calendar, the hirings, the grant applications, the scheduling. It's a tremendous amount of work that people are working on all summer long. So in terms of the Student Services Office, um, a lot of the professional development overlapped with the work that Mr. Martin shared. One of the other bullets up there is that we did offer lively letters, which is another specialized reading program for some of our special education teachers. Um, but really, Mr. Martin and I work very closely around professional development, and that was actually a project we're working on this year, is really aligning the calendar and the offerings that we have so that there's not as much overlap because it is taxing on our principals to find sub coverage and so we've really done a lot of coordination on that. Additionally, a big piece of the summer, as you all know, is in um, special education, we offer extended school year programming for those students who are at risk for substantial regression. So Kelly Decato and Karen Rando were the co-coordinators of the programs and I have to applaud them because they did some amazing work this summer. We had roughly 260 students, pre-K to post-grad, who were recommended for summer services. Uh, the elementary program was located at Birch Meadow, which really um, allowed for a large number of our students to be in their home schools. So as you know, Birch Meadow houses our Connections and Compass programs, and so to house the extended school year program there allowed those students to be in their home school. Um, our TSP program, our therapeutic support program across all levels, was very successful. Um, we had some students who have had a lot of difficulty getting into school during the school year, and we were able to have them participate regularly during the summer, which is very exciting, and it's momentum that we can build upon for the school year, and thankfully, a lot of the staff who do work in the summer are the staff that work during the school year, so they have those connections. Um, we did separate out our bridge program services, so in the past, Students who are in the bridge program, our language-based learning disability program, receive tutoring. We differentiated that 
this year at all levels and we feel like that was very successful particularly at middle school and high school we felt it really allowed for some more specialized instruction and I received some really positive feedback from some families regarding that um, the school resource officer visited some of our classrooms this summer and in addition um, as you know we accepted a donation from some of our families um, in the spring and we were able to offer an art enrichment program through follow um, through follow your art studio and we had over 45 students who participated in this activity so that was really exciting overall it was a very positive summer actually this morning as we were having <coughs> breakfast with some of the staff a few of the teachers who worked in the program came up to me to say what a great summer it was and how smooth it went I think it's also important to note that we um, house with extended day we house extended day in the special ed program in the same elementary school in order to ensure that if parents need child care after their child receives tutoring or their special ed program we can ease that transition so I think it really helps with participation it helps with supervision um, and so overall it was very positive um, I do have a couple of pictures so we have a picture of one of our police officers and a picture of the artwork um, uh, but again it was very positive um, I think the other piece that I would note as mr. Martin um, reference that there's a lot of activities happening in the student services office to get ready for the new school year we continue to have some vacancies we have a part-time BCBA position that unfortunately we made an offer and someone um, backed out we have a team chair position that shared at Birch Meadow and Wood End that we have offered twice now and have not met with success so um, that's concerning and we are hoping to have a behavioral health coach um, replacing Sarah Bird's position finalized very soon um, all of that has been very you know it's a lot of work to go through that interview process and to really vet the candidates to make sure that we have the right people that are gonna you know meet our needs um, in addition there are a lot of projects and tasks that need to get done um, our office goes down to kind of a bare bones just like all the other schools but different than the schools there are a lot of inquiries there's a lot of activity in special education over the summer and with no team chairs on staff a lot of that falls on me to communicate with families to produce documents to kind of work on tasks so that's a lot of the work that's happening in my my office over the summer I did have some of our team chairs come in for some additional days to do some work in their buildings um, or to work on some special projects that really needed to get done to start the school year up and support that um, additionally I had one meeting with the CPAC over the summer and we've mapped out some meetings which I'm excited about and I'm going to be sending out notice to our families with these dates already outlined so that families can start to put them on the calendar we've also included them on the district calendar so we can see that there's not an overlap with other things happening which um, has been a concern in the past and I really was trying to emphasize with those families the importance of getting these dates on the calendar early mm -hmm. so that we don't have those conflicts and we can really get um, information to families soon so we are excited we have two presentations coming up in the fall with the Federation for children with special needs to really help our parents understand their rights in the special education process we also I have secured um, Sarah Ward to come out in March she um, is well known for um, executive functioning and we think that'll be a big draw stone and public schools has agreed to collaborate with us on that um, and in addition Lisa Studer has offered our, our district-wide BCBA to also do uh, training because many families really want to hear from her so we have some exciting things happening September 14th at 7 o'clock is going to be um, a business meeting for them but also a meet and greet with team chairs and special ed staff so I think that's kind of encapsulates it's been a very busy summer lots of things happening in mm -hmm. student services and very exciting things I mean we're very excited about what's happening um, and what will be happening right. so I'm going to update you on the work that's been going on uh, in our buildings um, from a facility standpoint but also from a technology standpoint so um, it's really in three categories the summer projects the FY 17 capital and the FY 18 capital so you can see well, maybe not because it's kind of tiny and I apologize. <laughs> um, but some of the things, it's been, it's been a lot of painting that has been going on um, in, our, in our schools. Um, we try to do painting every single year to keep up with um, making sure that, you know, there's a, there's a rotation. 
Um, I think you can see, depending on the school, some, and, and really the building principal is um, the one that is leading this in terms of what should get painted. Uh, we did budget a certain amount of painting to be done um, in each of the schools, depending on the, the size of the school. Some, it was classrooms, others it was hallways, um, and others it was larger uh, spaces, uh, like a cafeteria. So um, that was one of the major things that was done. Other things that were done, uh, without going into detail on each one, um, in classroom rugs, if you remember, uh, last year uh, we did have to um, dispose of several uh, rugs that did not were not fireproof. Um, the fire department said, uh, and a lot of these were rugs that teachers had brought in to make, you know, the classroom um, a lot more accommodating for learners. Um, for especially in the elementary schools, with um, they have a lot of open circle activities on rugs or reading activities on rugs or other things like that. So. Um, we did get in a lot of rugs to replace those rugs. Um, the clocks at Coolidge, which are the clocks that have been here since the project, which was in 2001, um, we, they're in progress, but they should be done in the next couple of days. So all the clocks have been replaced. A lot of them uh, were no longer working. Um, something that is going to be a savings uh, from a budgetary standpoint is um, changing out all of the dispensers for paper towels and toilet paper. That may seem like, uh, you know, why are you doing that? Uh, unfortunately, the, the previous dispensers that were in there were proprietary. So you had, we had to purchase a certain type of paper towel and toilet paper, which was much more expensive. Um, by going to a more generic dispenser, we can now go and get a much cheaper um, product uh, for paper towels and toilet paper. So, that is something that we, um, the facilities department did this summer to, to change all of those, which will actually lead to a savings in the operational budget. Um, the Eaton Attic has been cleaned out. That was a storage area for years of um, discarded furniture, and you did approve that um, in a previous meeting. Um, so that has been all discarded. Uh, some other things that were done, the um, Lion's Den, which is that building that's down near the uh, football field, got a new roof. Um, you did approve this evening. The shingles were donated by Rotary and the labor was provided by the facilities department so it now has a new roof. Um, there was a lot of concrete work done um, in different areas. You're going to see both um, here at the high school but also at Parker and at Wood End. At Wood End the entire front area was replaced. Um, it had been chipping and cracking uh, over the last several years. Um, it does get worn out, a lot of use, um, and it was completely done. And unfortunately, it had to be done a second time. Uh, we did have some problems with it. It was not at our expense, but this weekend it was finally completed. Um, and it looks, it looks great. So those are, those are some of the things that were happening for summer projects for FY17 Capital. There was some HVAC work done at uh, Wood End, but at all the schools in terms of the energy management system. Um, there was some flooring done at Eaton. Um, there was a whole section of Eaton where we did tile abatement and put in all new tile. Um, and that was one of the areas that we also got uh, uh, painting done this summer. Um, that whole hallway looks beautiful between the tiles, the classrooms that were new tile and the, the paint work that was done in the, above the lockers. Um, I already mentioned about the concrete work done at Wood End and Parker. And then FY18 Capital, um, Barrows flooring is in progress and that will be done during the Christmas break. There was flooring done at Killam and Parker and the high school. So you can see there has been an awful lot of facilities work uh, being done both inside and outside the building this summer. Um, so you can see that there's a lot been going on this summer. Um, in addition, we have had a lot of technology work getting done this summer. And Craig, Craig mentioned um, that as part of the uh, funding that was approved by Town Meeting for Science, there was uh, technology purchased as part of that. Um, we also had funding in our budget for FY17 for technology purchases. So we upgraded or replaced uh, 540 computers this summer. Um, 
through our technology department. Um, there's also been a lot of upgrading and replacing of student computers, um, staff computers. Actually, that was all part of the, the 540. Um, upgraded and replaced projectors, 44 of those. Um, we, uh, the, the technology department upgraded uh, over 600 computers to Windows 10. Um, is part of is part of um, you know making sure that our our computers are updated and um, that we have the you know the most updated virus protection and and other uh, pieces for uh, student learning and for teacher use. Um, we have new student accounts because we have new students, both kindergarten and any new students coming in. Uh, we've created and installed a new facilities management server. Um, there's been um, new. What one of the things that was done uh, in collaboration with between Gail and Julian, our network manager, is we did um, our three-year contract was ending with one of our copier companies, and now we have a new uh, copier company, um, Kiyosera. Um, so that requires a technology component as well as um, a, a, a piece where the finance department is in, involved in that, and so now all of our schools have uh, the, the, new, the new copiers. Um, we have a new password policy system, which is going to um, really improve the security, technology security. Um, there's a new uh, password management system, which I talked about, integrated Google account creation use. So there's been a lot of um, infrastructure work that has been done this summer um, around technology as well. And then the last piece I just want to talk about is some updates. And one of the things that we said that we were going to do is continue to update you on any changes that were happening um, to the budget as we were going through the budget. Um, you will continue to get more detailed quarterly updates um, and also a personnel update at those quarterly times. Um, probably at the end of September, uh, Gail will be able to give you a final FY17 report. Um, that, that is working with the town as well as schools to close out the books and make sure that um, all of our, our numbers match. And so that probably will happen at the end of September for FY17, and FY18 will be um, a little bit later um, in, the, in the fall. So some adjustments that we've had to make to the FY18 budget. Um, we, we budgeted for 13 kindergarten classrooms. There, were, there are 14 kindergarten classrooms, which required an additional regular education paraeducator. Um, so that is an adjustment that we had to make. Uh, we have had to <coughs> add 2.5 FTE special education paraeducators this um, summer. Uh, this is an increase in service for dis students with disabilities at Birch Meadow and Coolidge. Um, we did have to uh, go from one bus to do bu two buses. Um, there was a need for bus transportation at Parker, um, so that was an additional cost. And we will need to provide some additional temporary help in the finance department. In our last meeting, I, um, we did not, uh, we postponed the agenda item in terms of looking at a position. Um, we are going to build that position in the base budget for FY19. It is a position that is needed. Um, in the meantime, though, no. uh, we are going to look at some temporary help. We are identifying areas that a, a temporary person could do um, as we move forward during this budget process and beyond. Um, so that, that is something that we're, we are going to be moving forward with, but definitely we'll be putting that in the base budget for FY19. And I believe that's our update. John, I think Dr. that... Dr. Nye? Yeah. Um, just I think it's important for the community. I think the school committee understands where that funding came from, but if you could just Thank you, clarify sure. with that. Um, so the funding, the funding that for these positions is really coming from turnover of staff this summer. So when, and I believe, I believe this, we hired 31 new teachers. Um, so when, when teachers are being hired and the people that they're replacing, Sometimes we are in the positive in terms of um, the salary 
savings from a teacher coming into a teacher leaving. Other times we are not. I mean, you, you did hear a lot of experienced teachers' um, profiles tonight. Um, so there are some times when it costs more to fill a position, uh, particularly areas like chemistry or physics or some of those high need positions, special education, foreign language. Um, other times that we have opportunities where there is some um, salary savings. So we do have salary savings where we are able to um, uh, move forward with, with these positions. I mean, we, we unfortunately do not have a choice. I mean, the special education piece is tied into children's IEPs. The extra paraeducator is for a 14th classroom, which we did not budget for because we built a budget based on um, what we had this last year, which was 13. But it is through salary savings yeah. and, in the summer. I, I think it's important to understand that if, um, if we didn't have any of that, if we had um, the preponderance of teachers that we hired that were, uh, we needed to offer salaries that were on average above, and we, we need these positions to serve children. It's required by law. We would be in a position of really going back to finance committee or something. Or we we have to do this, to, right. right, to tell me this is not, so um, I don't know if this is, you know, this is three and a half um, positions um, and then some, you know, the, the um, temporary, some temporary support, but the three and a half positions, I don't know if that's sort of typical or not. I'd have to sort of look back at the data, but I think it's important for us to all understand this isn't, you know, in the, in the same way that um, at the end of the year, the, um, the, t the town, when, uh, when firefighters are needed, there's overtime required or police overtime is required, it's executed. And at the end of the year, the town comes back uh, and asks for that additional funding. And so. part of the process we go through is we do meet regularly through the central office leadership team to assess each of the positions and make sure they act, they're tied to an IEP. It's tied to the addition of a classroom. So there is a lot of legwork that goes into it prior to us actually. We spent, yeah. Carolyn, Ms. Wilson knows the amount of time we spent actually assessing and looking at the hours across the district to say, okay, do we have anything we can shift? Is it tied directly to an IEP? So there is a, a lot of work that goes into the determination to actually move forward. And then we do sit and assess, do we have any savings from hiring when we combine all of it with some that came in higher, some that came in lower to say, can do we have the ability as of today to fund the positions? Thank you. Thank you. So also, I would, it, some point in time, not tonight, um, the exact amount that we did have for carryover. And then also, any time, like, you know, obviously, um, those aren't obvious, over, overly expensive positions, but to be able to tally it up and let us know how much we did spend out of that, I think is important. And that's gonna be part of your quarterly update. Okay. So when you have the quarterly financial update, you'll, you'll get that information plus the- We'll be specific though, we'll be able to state, this is, this is funding that you know, yes. we were able to draw yes. down from our savings, because I think that's important, as we know we are obligated to come up with, what is it, 210,000 that we were supposed to no, 120, 135,000. 135,000, right. <clears throat> that we are obligated to put forward towards this year's budget. It will come, some of it will come from this, and if not all of it, right? So. Well, how can we do that? 135, let me, let me clarify. 135,000 is being held uh, by the town in their budget uh, for, they're holding, a per, they're holding purchases. So we were looking for 400 and how much to reinstate middle school uh, foreign language? 400 and so if you remember when we had this discussion um, in the spring, um, it was through a series of things, also including we were cutting technology money this year, right. and we cut per pupil funding this year. Um, so that, that's how we got, we had to balance the budget. We also cut our substitute teacher line, um, knowing that we had to, to had to create a balanced budget. So when it was all said and done, it ended up being about a $435,000. But some of it was cuts we had to make this year in materials and goods and supplies. Wasn't some of it coming out of the 50, you know, the anticipated savings from 
Um, we, we had to turnover. Some yes. of the funding was from actual known differences. We built those into the budget because 90, we had 000. done some it hiring. 90, it was 90000 right. right. That, that was already factored right. into the budget. So, so that would be coming out of whatever that carryover is. That 90, so whatever, so let's say we had. No, we've already reduced our budget that, that amount. We, re, right, we, we, had to, we had to go in with a balanced budget. Right. So that's already, that's already been reduced. Not clear on that. I think we should, if we need to review that, perhaps we should review it at our next meeting. And, That's a good and, idea. And but I think we should move forward today. Yes. So just to follow up on Gary's point, I have two questions about the budget, and I have two questions: one for Craig and one for Carolyn about their presentation. Just really quickly, when we talk about the FY18 budget, when we have our next quarterly update, I think. To Gary's point, I agree, it would be helpful to have an accounting at some level of where funds are regenerated with, within each, um, we don't call them, uh, I said it, not business units, but what do we call Cost them? centers. Cost centers, thank you. So within each cost center, the superintendent has discretion to move funds within the approved budget by the school committee. Um, so when that occurs, it would be helpful to have an accounting of one, you know, what all of these adjustments costs and pluses and minuses. Uh, the second thing is that we sat in this room, and I think in February, and voted, the school committee voted for an unbalanced budget, and then there were a series of subsequent discussions with the town and finance committee to get to where we are today. I think it would be helpful to have a short recap of where things ended um, with the approval of the, of the town budget. And the reason I say that is that I was under the impression that the town had some holdbacks uh, that they were making in the interest of ultimately balancing the town's budget. And so if, the, if, the ta if there's a perception in the community that the town is holding back um, money or holding back something, uh, expecting the school committee or, or the superintendent and the schools to, to do something else, I, I would just like to, for the schools part of it, make sure that we're well coordinated with the town and their spending and that every, literally everybody's on the same page uh, and, and that people realize that. So that's how we're going to report an FY18 budget. Just be, you know, we have control of the school committee votes the budget, the superintendent administers the budget. I'm not changing any of that. I'm just pointing out there was a wider conversation than just the school committee to get this year's budget passed. So I want to honor and respect, the, you know, the other voices in the community participated in that. That's it for 18. Uh, for FY17, the, um, again, it's just a kind of an accounting question. So I guess, Craig, this goes to your presentation. The, Accounting of the 150K, that second of three tranches, I'll call them a group collection of money that was approved by the town. So it was 150K and then 150K for 16, 17, uh, and I think 18. Or is just 17, 18? No, it's just, it's just, it's just it was, FY17. We're going to ask for 19, maybe, but that's a separate conversation. So 17, 18. For the latest 150K installment, can we get an accounting by town meeting of where that went. So when, when, when the town meeting approved that extra money for the science, <coughs> I just want to, by the time we have town meeting this fall, I would like a document in the public record that people can go to see how the school spent that money. So it's clear what they got for their money. Sure. Okay. Um, and then, Craig, one other question for you on your presentation. Uh, you have the number, I, I'd be interested in whether we track the number of teacher, the number of, I want you to say teachers, because some of us for superintendents, right, but the number of eligible personnel within our academic community who attend these professional development opportunities. So maybe for one opportunity, you said all teachers were attended, so maybe that's 100% attendance or utilization rate of that. For the superintendents one, maybe it's one or five people, right, but I'm interested in what percentage of eligible participants in our district are actually participating in these PD opportunities? Particularly if we have a sunk cost for the venue and the speaker, are we getting 10% of eligible people or are we getting 90% of eligible people? Because yeah. I'd like to be yeah. closer to 90. Right. right. So um, how do, you, do we track that or what's your impressions? Yeah, I mean obviously for, for professional development that we <coughs> offer through the school year where people are, you know, it's during their work time. Um, then it's, it's a different situation. So during the summer, it's sort of a little bit different metric, you know, because um, that's why I mentioned, like, if we're able to provide the space for something, if we're able to collaborate with another district, because we realize that it's just not going to work for everybody, but as long as it's working for a number of people to make it cost effective. Um, like, for instance, I think with the mathematics, we had 20, maybe 25 people from Reading, which is actually a pretty good um, turnout, it was across all levels. I mean, that particular workshop. Um, 
the um, teaching all kind. I think it was about the same. I'd have to go back and look. I think it was around 20. Um, but again, because we're providing the space. So when we're doing things for the summer, we realize we're not going to hit everybody. Even if we said, okay, this is for grade three, there's just no way any week in the summer is going to work for all grade three teachers. So we're, we try to offer things that are um, very relevant to their work, but it's absolutely not like the essential part of the PD. Like if we're doing things with new curriculum or stuff where everyone needs to, we're going to have to wait for another time. So <coughs> these are things to add to professional growth, um, but they're not going to be things that we're going to have as an expectation for all staff. I don't know so if that's kind of yeah, I just just be interested when we report on these opportunities of learning. Uh, what percentage of eligible participants are, are attending? And the second question is, what percentage of our professional development events offer PDP points for the te pe it, teachers or participants? And I think one thing yeah. that we'll need to factor in, some of them, the classes are limited to 30 people. Yeah, so you may it. have 70 people that are eligible, but we can only have 30 people. So I wouldn't yeah. want to say out yeah. of 70, you so had 30. It, it would be like some of it's limited to class enrollment okay. based on utilization rate. So if, if it's 30 and we get 30, that's 100 percent utilization okay. rate. If it's 30, I, we get two. Gotcha. Then I, yeah. I want to ask what's going on. I was going to suggest the same question about uh, PDPs, professional development points, which yes. which teachers need to recertify. Absolutely. I mean, this is an opportunity too. Um, that some teachers will say, oh, I need this, or like take the math course, for instance. There are people that could say, I actually want PDPs specific to mathematics, um, that that's an opportunity for teachers to do that, and they absolutely do get the PDPs um, for do the know what, licensing. Like all of our events, some of the events? And all of, any of the PD that we offer, we are able to yeah. do that, yes. Yeah. yeah. What? Can I, 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 I just want to, if I can just say one other thing, that I just want to make sure the public understands when teachers attend events during the summer, unless it's specific curriculum work that we have asked them to do, they are not getting compensated for it. And that's, thank you for that clarification. Because I think people need to understand that they're not getting compensated for coming to these trainings. Well, we're paying at some level to have the training, right? Well, we donations. are, but we're not paying for the teachers to attend the training well, during the donations. summer. That's a great right. point. Can, some of it's donations, some of it's grants. It's, it's a combination that we Like we've some of it was using. through the REF grant. We had yep. one of the ref grants okay. paid for um, I, I, can I just so as, as I was listening to the report I was you know struck there there's a considerable amount that of the professional development is provided by donations and I just really I agree that we need da the data to make the right decisions and good decisions but I also really want to be cognizant about we we have a really steep hill over the next couple of months and this is the staff this is it Carolyn doesn't have anyone else. Gail doesn't have anyone else. Every time we ask them to dig into some data to provide something, we have to understand now there's a cost. And I just, you know, we, we need to make sure that the community is hearing the information and that it's transparent. But I, I really think we need to be very cautious about we need data that's going to help us make the best decisions we can about where to put the limited funds we have to get the most out of those funds in the focus areas that we have. And this is our staff to do that. This is our staff to lead the rest of the staff in the district. And if we, you know, I, I also feel like we are asking for data that you do already provide. So maybe we just need to be reminded of this is the data or it, you know, maybe we just need to put the bullets in a different spot in terms of how we're seeing the data. I just really wanna be cognizant of that because we're not gonna make it through this this road. We're not going to make it to October with the staff if we keep burdening. Talk, talk I think we also have to recognize the savings when we're talking about programs being here. We're talking about teachers not having to travel. We're talking about other teachers from other districts both sharing and also helping to compensate, um, paying some of the bills, so to speak. Um, my question was really also about um, the temp because I'm hearing all these requests for numbers and um, processing, and I'm wondering about how much we spend on training and retraining when it's a temp pro person. So I want us to consider all sides of this. <coughs> it's not just what we spend, it's what we save by doing it a certain way. So are we actually spending more in time and energy in a temp person for Gail. That's um, just for a specific example. 
when it's something that would be valuable all the way along. Um, I don't want us to be penny wise, pound foolish, as we've seen. Um, so I just want to register that we save money by spending money sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that I think if we want all this more information, we need to acknowledge, like Mrs. Webb said, the cost of our people's time and the limits of our people's time because we want them to stay. And if we use them up by making them work seven days a week, as I heard today at the teacher meeting at seven o'clock, some of our administrators don't leave. They're there seven days a week. If we burn them out, we have to retrain, we have to pay more for replacements, and we lose great people. So I think we just need to think about that. Can I, I just yes. want to give a quick example. I was talking about the math course of sort of some of the behind the scenes hours that goes on. I mean, the way that started was with a couple of our teachers many months ago. Professor Sharma was giving that course in a few different places in the region where essentially there's an organization that's hired him to provide the course. There's even graduate credits available. Um, and then people are buying their slots. There's a, essentially a tuition. One of our teachers in particular had applied for an REF grant that was so passionate about this, you know, in REF. So behind the scenes we're, we're talking about, yes, they're gonna grant that, but if we could actually bring Professor Sharma here, and you know, for what it costs one person, we could probably send four to it and so it's a matter of re-channeling some of that fund reaching out to other districts to say wow you know if I could get Professor Sharma here conversations with Professor Sharma what are, what's your calendar for the summer could we arrange this um, how many slots would this district like we reach out to different then we figure out we can make this work and essentially we can now train you know 20 some people mm -hmm. for what it might have cost us for a much smaller number um, so that's the kind of stuff that we're constantly doing to see to get the biggest bang for the buck. <laughs> and there's the exchange of ideas in those classes by bringing mm -hmm. in people, teachers mm -hmm. who are doing best practices in other districts. And right. that's valuable. Yes. I just want to say, Elaine and, and Linda, I, I agree with what, what they said about I'm not looking here to create be clear, or even Carolyn, I'm not looking to drill into existing data. That's not what my request is. I'm just <coughs> looking forward and saying when you, Craig, for instance, present a, a result and say, we had these results, four out of five, five out of five assessments from teachers. We obviously do some kind of a responsible, we spend the taxpayer money or donation money to, to have a PD. We get feedback about it and we try to improve. What I'm saying is part of that presentation could be Look, there were 30 slots and all 30 of them were used. Going forward, I'm not, I'm not asking for more data. I'll be very clear and I completely agree with the points that, that the other committee members just raised. We have to be responsible in our use of your time as a resource. Uh, but I think in the future it's helpful to hear that. Hey, we had 100% of available slots taken. This is great. Or we had, you know, whatever. Um, and in Carolina, the same kind of thing with you. It's 260 students eligible for receiving instruction. I think you just going forward be able to say, we identified this number of students, this number had actually received instruction, and here were the drivers of why and how we can improve from what we learned from yeah, that. Yeah, which is always a variable. Anyway. It is a variable, just yeah. so you understand in the summer, because families have oh, vacation. So when we say we had 260 students eligible, we may have had students who attended for one week and then sure. spent the rest of their summer in a camp. We may have had students who were there with us the whole summer. I mean, it's very variable, and we have to plan Unfortunately or fortunately, we plan for the students who are recommended because we don't know who's going to show up at the door and we don't want to be understaffed in terms of meeting students' IEPs. So we plan for those who we have the data to say they'll attend. And that's a whole variety. That could be a student just getting speech one time a week. Mm -hmm. So it's not students always in our <coughs> programs. It's very variable. Um, right, and, and we have to plan to meet every student's yes. need, as you plan. Yeah. No, yep. we, we, we get the uncertainties and the challenges to, to some extent, and, and to the extent you can help us um, by sharing information about, you know, like I'm mentioning in the future, I think it's just helpful for how we think about it, but I'm not asking for anything yep. new. For Gail, for the FY17 science and the FY18 budget accounting of where we move money within a cost center, I, th I think because the FY17 was a special specific grant from the town to the schools, I think it's good to have yeah, we have there. We have we that, to that pulled together. Uh, Mr. Martin and I worked very closely from town meeting until the end of the year along with 
um, Julian Carr to yeah, map you, out good. the, the 150000 So we spent a considerable amount of time working through that. Thank you. I think it should be a, a handout yeah. to town meeting, not a value judgment discussion on what we spent it on. Oh, I completely agree. It's just an accounting. Mm -hmm. People know what they mm -hmm. bought. That's it. Mm -hmm. So what you got. Thank you. And not to belabor the point, but I don't think we asked for anything that isn't readily available anyways. Um, you know, like, for, for example, the amount of money that was, how the money was expended on $50,000. It just, we just have to be, I think, under the circumstances going forward with an unbalanced budget, getting support from the Finance Committee, from the town government side for changes in our budget. We just have to be very, very clear under those circumstances going forward as we're looking for an override. And I think, you know, oftentimes you've heard here and heard other places where, oh, they don't need the money, they'll find it, don't worry about it. And we may have found it, but we need to explain how we found it and, and just be very, very clear in terms of how the money that we do get, like that $150,000 to me, I think is very important. This is how it was spent and, um, you know, not, Again, it's not a value judgment. It's just this is how we this is how it was spent. You gave it to us, and this is what we do with it. And I think, in my mind, from what I read, it was all well spent. Um, in, oh, in line with the budget topic, all right. um, everyone has. Can a, I? I, I oh, forgot about finish? one last uh, area in your information piece. Um, I'd be remiss since a year ago we were having major discussions about this. Um, I have given you the latest water tests yep. for this year. Um, the good news is is that they, we have had no lead in water issues at the two schools um, that we did test this summer, which included uh, Joshua Eaton and Rise, which also is the central uh, office water area. Um, but the memo clearly outlines, and I, I want to thank the Water Department, again, for their help in this, um, clearly outlines um, where they can, people can find the results, where people can find the, um, the other information. And also, I gave an update on Killam, um, which will still be using bottled water this year, and how we're going to approach um, all of the kitchen faucets in, the, uh, in our kitchens this year. So that is all captured in this memo. I just wanted to point that out. Um, and we will continue testing next year um, according to the plan. We are over testing from what the state is recommending, so I want to make that clear as well. Next year we're um, scheduled to test Parker and Barrows. So we'll be doing all of the uh, faucets and um, at Parker and Barrows next year. I'm sorry, I, I just no. wanted to make sure we did people heard that. I just want to draw um Members, committee members' attention to the memo from Chairman Robinson and I um, dated today, and it is in preparation for the development of the superintendent's uh, recommended budget and in preparation for our process um, with that budget. Um, and basically, you can sort of read the, the details there, but we're asking that each committee member provide sort of three guiding principles for both the, the budget that's aligned with um, the less than 2% increase um, that we expect to be the FinCom's guidance and the budget and the uh, an enhanced view, um, which would require a passage of the override. And what we're asking committee members is for each of us to review document the documents for the district goals and the focus areas, as well as I um, we felt that the rationale that was developed last year is also just a good reference document but provide those um, guiding principles to uh, Chairman Robinson and I on, by September 6th so that we, they can be part of our agenda and discussion on um, the meeting September 11th. It's essential that um, Dr. Darty and Ms. Dowd and um, uh, Ms. Wilson and Craig, Mr. Martin have this um, information and that it's and that we do have an opportunity to discuss it so that we each sort of bring those principles to the table and we'll discuss them on the, on the 11th and, and, and that memo was actually part of the, <laughs> the budget discussion that but that's fine that oh, oh. a part of what okay. so in the packet as well we included a draft of the FY19 
calendar that highlights um, a lot of the key dates as we go through the budget process. And these dates, for those who attended the Finance Committee meeting, which seems like it was a long time ago, yeah. but I think it was last month, um, to talk about the fact that we're, we're trying to accelerate some of the budget timeline in order to make sure we have everything prepared for the baseline, as well as the enhanced view. The schedule that we put forth for everyone, a couple <coughs> of the key dates, the guiding principles will be important for us as we start to go through and develop the budgets. October 11th is when we are anticipating that we will have the final guidance from Finance Committee. As Mr. Martin mentioned, October 21st is when the um, we are planning the parent university. One of the sessions we are looking to potentially have that day, depending on interest, is a discussion overall on how the budget process works so that those parents that are interested in that will offer a session that Saturday. Similar to what was done last year, Dr. Darty will have his community forums as well as office hours. And to the extent parents have questions, I, can, I will be participating in those as well to help educate the community as much as possible. We will be looking the last week of December to distribute the budget documents, which will include the budget book as well as the document on the enhanced view of the budget as well. We did want to point out that we have laid out preliminarily how we plan to step through the various presentations during the month of January. We have added a Saturday session, which is Saturday, January 13th, in order to make sure in the accelerated time frame we have enough time to get through everything. So we did add that date because we want to make sure we allot enough time, especially since we also want to cover the potential override budget. We also have laid out in here time when we would anticipate receiving questions from the committee so that we can also allocate enough time to ensure that we are addressing the questions throughout the process from the committee as well as from finance committee and town meeting members. And the goal this year will be for the various members of the committees to be attending all of these meetings so that when we get to the finance committee meeting, it'll be more so to address questions as opposed to do a full presentation because if they're attending the meetings, they should have the bulk of what they need. Yes, two questions. One, um, first of all, before we get to questions, this is really well done. Thank you. I like the timesheet. This is this is a really helpful tool to align the community around an area that was a lot of discussion. I thought the discussion last year was very compact in February, uh, January, and I think this will hopefully help spread that out more and allow more time for uh, all, everybody in the community to participate in different ways. The question I have, so first of all, when, you mentioned <coughs> that October 11th is the date that you get the final FinCom guidance. Did I hear you right? Yes. Um, so. Do we have a, can we get a sense before then, uh, you know, of, of kind of ballpark, what kind of gap may exist between, you mentioned a less than 2% increase in the memo. Do we, do we have a sense of how that compares to our level of service for FY19? We have September not. September 20th, right? We, that's where looking at some of the guiding principles as well as we typically wait until we have the majority of our hiring done in order to project what we think the compensation costs will be. So that's what we'll be working on in the September, October time frame. So the level service estimate we won't have before September 20th? Correct. Okay. So the soon, yeah, the sooner we can get, to me, to me that that's a really important part of, if we can identify principles, that if we're looking at a, something on the order of a half a million dollar gap, that's, that's one set of, Realities. If we're looking at a one and a half million dollar gap or something really big, that's that's a very different set of realities, right? So, whenever we get that information and are able to publicly discuss it, just even directionally, that that's a big difference in how I think about principles and, and what kinds of changes. You know, we, we might you're not going to get that information until you receive the budget book in late December. So we can't get an order of magnitude no. estimate of no. what, we don't know what our level of service The guiding is. principles are going to come from you prior to that. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to get an estimate of what our level of service no. cost is even once we've no. 
we there's no way we can build that's why it takes us till December to build a budget Maybe a separate discussion on that question. But I misunderstood I the question. I thought you were asking what the. T so on September 20th, we'll we'll know from the what what the potential sh shortfall will be. Correct for the town and schools. There, I think there are two separate. So what we'll be doing in the fall is to update the FY18. Budget and project, right. not budget, but projections to see we are for the current fiscal year to determine what, if any, holdback the town has that we may or may not need to tap into. That'll be in the September October time frame for the FY19. That happens after we start updating the FY18, and that's where we're looking at the September 11th meeting to get some high-level guiding principles to help us as we're going through developing. The FY19 budget. Th that was this was the detailed discussion through the um, August at the selectmen's meetings and with the, the FinCom, FinCom. Um, and then and right our meeting we had a meeting with the FinCom um, members of the selectmen were also there. I mean I think we we went we've had this dialogue about what you know when we could get these numbers, what had to be done to close out the year, what had to be done to create the recommended budget. And this was the mm. timeline that we agreed to. I got my I got my scratch sheet. And then this was these details were developed consistent with that. Um, so that is why the guiding principles are so important. No, I don't I don't I understand the origin of the timeline. I think it's a good timeline. Um, I'm, I'm just a little surprised that we don't even have an order of magnitude estimate within 50. There's a lot of factors that go into that. We're going to need to know accommodated costs from the town. We're going to need to know some other factors that involve um, labor costs. Those are all things that um, we will not have that information at that time. As Gail said, we, we need to go through three payrolls of complete staff to get an understanding of what the staff costs are this year. We're and currently you, working you, on even, um, Mrs. Wilson and I actually start our weekly meetings on Wednesday this week to start going through where we are with out-of-district tuitions. We still do not have all of our grant numbers for FY18 to determine where we are against where we thought we were going to be with some of the larger grants where we have staffing costs on them. So in order to get a updated snapshot of 18 we need some of that information before we can even start I would be amiss if I tried to predict FY19 out of district tuition and transportation without having a relatively decent update on FY18 so there we're working through all of those and, and pieces currently I understand it's many moving targets at once and it may it's a I don't want to dig down into this too much at this point I, I just wanted to get a sense of at a high level what's coming the earliest we would know what our level service budget then as you understand it is that like the October 11th meeting that is when we will have funding from the town to say the accommodated costs are X and your budget funding is X that's when we will know that's what when we the have the agreement agreement of the numbers when is level service coming when are we going to get a number for that that is December in the, the December, December time frame December. December 18th meeting the public hearing by then no when you get the budget book in late December is when you will have that information. So end of December, budget documents right. that date. All right. What's the, the September 20th financial form for? I mean, what? That we're still waiting on final. That's yeah. a placeholder that the yeah, town sure had put on for any necessary. financial updates. My guess is it may not happen. It may not happen. We just put it as a placeholder for now. That would be much more of a high level at that point. I think we'll still be working on the free cash number and pieces right. of that. So we don't anticipate getting final guidance until the October 11th. But FinCom had put that as a, as a placeholder for, I think, it might be more just general conversations. The second question was just the override spreadsheet, so the structure of the budget as we understand it. So we'll have a budget that assumes current projected funding based on the FinCom guidance that we received in October. 
And then we have something in here called an override spreadsheet. And so the spreadsheet, is that going to be an accounting of what we would do if the override is approved? That's so the, what we, this is what we're requesting. This is what we'll do with it. Right. So the vision of that would be to take what is in the superintendent's balance budget and any ads that we're putting, and it'll be more annotated to say here, is, here are the cost centers, and within each cost center, this is specifically whether it's FTE, whether it's technology, sure. um, whether it's curriculum based so we'll have an accounting of here are the additions to get you from the baseline to the enhanced view most likely what you would see in a override or enhanced budget are things that we have had to cut over the last few years and potentially would be cutting in FY19 so we'd see an accounting of mm -hmm. yes these are the yes. things that we would be getting yes. this is how it benefits students so it won't be the budget book it'll be probably a two to three page so, document. Just to, if I don't mind if I can jump in, yeah. sorry. Do you have something? I just think it's important, like for example, the position you talked about that would be um, assisting Gail, we had that position at one point in time, correct? Correct. Yes, we did. Yeah, so that would be important to, because we, what we don't want to come across, we're adding new positions. It's restoring of, this money. It's restoring we're restoring things. Restoring, yeah. because I think that was a lot, you know, and that has to be, very clear because I think last, uh, you know, our, our last attempt, there were questions around that. And I know we did the best we could, but, you know, to really emphasize that these are not new positions. I think in some cases we did put some new positions in, but I think we need to be very careful about that because people are going to say, well, the extra money, they don't need those positions. They didn't have them before. So, and that's why I think that level service budget is very important when we can get that because I think people can say okay here's you know here's how, how much money we have this year this year allocated and if we want to have the same services we had this year and the previous year these are the things that we you know this is how much money we need let us level right. service <coughs> providing the services to students that we do this year I, that's gonna be that I think it'll be a combination because in order to what, what we've agreed to with Part of the discussion we had at the Finance Committee is that what gets presented and passed forward would be a balanced budget, basically balancing to what yeah, has been allocated. And then when we do the enhanced or override budget, that we would outline in there specifically everything that we are proposing to add back to the balanced. I don't want to risk calling it a level service. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Balance the purpose of tonight's discussion was to review the calendar. Yes. We're getting way too far into this yeah. uh, for tonight. So, yes. The, um, on December 18th, what finalized school budget is that going to be on? It's not going to be on a finalized school budget. It's a placeholder. The, the public hearing is going to be on that Saturday. I, I think it's on January. January 13th. The 19th. 19th. No. Uh, the January 13th is yeah. the open hearing. The December one was We're more still, of a high we, level yeah. but discussion. It's, right. it's an and it's an already scheduled school committee meeting, the December meeting. It's an opportunity for the public to give input early in the process. Well, there's supposed to be input on your final budget. And that, that'll be the January 13th. Right, because all aspects of the budget will be presented. Is that it? Yeah, and I'm sorry about that. I, I spoke about this um, with reports instead of the agenda item, so I apologize to the RCTV folks. I apologize. I didn't mean to do that. So I think RCTV is not Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bill, sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you for taking time to talk to us tonight. This is our uh, annual talk with you and what's going on at RCTV. I'm Phil Rushworth, the Executive Director of RCTV, and I'm joined uh, today by Kathy Crook, the President of RCTV, uh, John Carpenter, the Vice President, over there on camera, our treasurer, Steve Crook, who is actually the selectman appointee to the RCTV board. And I think Nick. 
And Nick, yes. <laughs> Nick, who is also uh, your, your school committee representative to the RPG board. Um, it's been a very busy year for us, and we're very excited that we are ready to be open for the first day of school with a operating TV studio and has all kinds of new equipment and a teacher. And uh, earlier you got to meet Laura during the new teacher um, introduction. So it's been a very busy summer for us, and uh, it's, it's been great. So. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I would like to um, mention or encourage um, part of what the town is doing, uh, you've been hearing through the spring and the summer about doing a survey for um, a community needs assessment. The funding for the studio comes from Comcast and Verizon and the funding for the studio here was money that we had saved um, in anticipation of the budget that the board chose then to um, accelerate the coming back into the school system. And we appreciate um, the superintendent and the <coughs> principal um, finding space for us, uh, facilities in, uh, do, with all the long list of everything else that they had to do, we needed them to help our room as well, IT and um, technology, although the equipment in there has been, you know, is all RCTV, you know, it's not school <coughs> equipment, but we needed um, whatever. So, um, but we want to encourage, take this opportunity to encourage um, both the school committee, the audience, and um, anyone else to do the survey that is available on the town website as well as rctv.org. Um, we, you know, we have a couple more days that we're keeping it open. This is a requirement for the contract negotiations that the town is doing with Comcast in um, the fall of, or by the fall of 18. Yes. Um, so we want just take another opportunity. If you haven't done the survey, please do the survey. If you sign it, you have the opportunity to win a drone. Um, <laughs> so. Yes, yeah, as an encouragement to get people to fill it out, we're, we're, there's a raffle for a, uh, a quad camera uh, drone. That uh, so anyone watching out there or here in the audience, <coughs> or if you win, you, you get to have a nice camera and, and training by RCTV staff on how to use it. Right. Is the link like right on the front page of the town website? Uh, it's yes. on the town website, yeah, and, and rctv.org. You're looking for the community needs assessment. Okay. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that I'm not sure how many students Laura has has actually signed up for the um, um, Elective. electives, but um, she's looking forward to doing that. We did send her home because she had been here since seven this morning. So, um, and you know, we're really looking forward to getting the students in earlier, um, having availability. We did a lot of sports programming last fall and the um, exciting aspect of that is the students that covered football actually got to go to Gillette and w not Gillette is yeah. it Gillette yeah, Gillette. yeah sorry and um, have press passes and be you know be like official Gillette people and so we're looking forward to having more student involvement having the studio here um, running were you are we doing it we're doing tonight live yes through the studio here we didn't have to no we we do have our equipment usually bring for meeting coverage tonight but the plan is is that if you're meeting in this space in the future we'll be able to use the equipment that's in that room and this will be a little easier for for our crew to to cover meetings when you're here which will be great we are live tonight and um yeah we're laura's very excited about getting running on the first day of school and um you know i know the numbers fluctuate until everything gets settled and so we're not sure how many kids are actually in the program yet but um, it will be you know a great program I'm sure and we are continuing our after-school program the RIV the Rocket Independent Video Club will meet weekly here in the space um, and yeah so we're available for, for questions if you have any questions for us yes 
I just I want to thank RCTV again for what you give back to our town as someone that's been organizing events uh, for over 20 years here. You have helped us extend the impact of those events to the people that can't come to the events, just like you do the school committee meetings and the selectmen meetings, and it's vital, vital service to the town. And I'm so excited about you being in the school and extending these opportunities to so busy, kids that are already so busy, but you're gonna be in the space where they are, which means it's gonna be easier for them to participate. And I'm looking forward to the interchange that that enables between our kids and the people that they might choose to interview. So they'll also get out of this ivory tower kind of environment and into the town and interviewing and interacting with other programs and, and vice versa, getting some of the people from the town into the schools to be a part of this. So I want to thank RCTV for this effort and for the funding and um, thank you and for staying late. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. Oh, Gary had a question. No, I, just a comment too that um, back in the day in when I was a uh, director of, uh, I forget, Applied Arts they called it in Danvers for a while and I oversaw that particular program that you have. Not that I had any great knowledge in it, but I could see the amount of student interest and um, how supportive it was to the, the school community in general. So I'm very excited that we're back. I know, I know years ago we had it here and uh, you know, we lost it, but now it's great that it's back. And I think uh, it'll build, maybe we won't have as many students this year because it, you know, but it'll, it'll grow. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just had a quick question. Um, so I, I was noticing about the um, interns graduated. Were, did you have high school interns that were part of the internship program? Or what, what does that mean exactly? Were, were they doing a, the senior internship with RCTV yes. during yeah. the second semester? It was semester. Through, through the guidance department. We were offering a program that was, they were credited um, and they would do, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the right term, work study or I don't, it was. Right, it, there's two different programs. That was different. Right. That was different than, than what? what you're referring to. Oh, okay. Maybe there's more than, more than two variations. Okay, I just was curious. This I know internship was the like whole year. Yes, there, unfortunately, Angela Merrill, who's our education coordinator, wasn't here tonight, and uh -huh. so she would be able to speak to exactly all oh. of that interaction. What you're talking about was just April to the end of the year. Oh, right, okay, so this was a, a more year-long program. I know there's a bunch of students who, you know, have particip participate long-term um, mm -hmm. with RCTV, and I think it's excellent, but I know we also, it's a great um, internship opportunity for that specific program too, which is mm -hmm. the second part of senior year. Yeah, yeah the, the superintendent invited us to the, the eighth grade fly-up day where they come and, and uh, um, you know, see all the electives and we were a part of that this year, so it was great to interact with a lot of students and you know, they signed up for, you know, information with the after school program or you know find out that we're you know we were coming here to the space so um, you know there's a lot of excitement from the students about us, us uh, being here so and we're great. we're happy to be here great excellent thank you You're thank you <coughs> first reading yeah now we have the first reading of okay. yep First reading oh, of policy IMDA. So um, this is the Accommodations for Religious and Ethnic Observances, Policy IMDA. The Reading School District serves children from many different religious and ethnic backgrounds. Mr. Bois. Since the American tradition. As discussed, I would like to make a motion that we table the reading in, in the interest of having this uh, publicly available anyone that wants to read so it. So we, we the dispense website. with the further reading. Right. I would like to do that. But we can still discuss that. I would yep. like to discuss it, yes. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? And to be clear, this full document is available in the right. packet handout for tonight, so anybody at home can. Can read I just the ask? Oh, we we got to finish the oh, vote. Oh, do we all those? Do we all vote? Yeah. Gary? Yeah. I thought we voted. Yeah. 
I was yes. just wondering if we could ask Dr. Doherty, just you mentioned the group of people, could you just refresh that? The n people who worked on this and what that time frame was to provide this input. Yes, so um, we had two high school teachers, one middle school teacher, um, three administrators, one from the elementary, uh, two from the high school, um, myself, and two parents. Um, we met twice. Uh, we spent the first meeting taking a look at um, are there areas of the policy that needed to change. Um, we also looked at other areas of the policy that needed to be clarified and strengthened. Um, through their recommendations, um, I created a draft that in the second meeting they responded to. And um, what you see here is their recommended product. Can, can you, do you mind going through the, uh, what actual substantive changes? Yes. There's a lot of them are Yes, yes. I'll be, some of it is moving things around trying to format it so it would make it look more user friendly. There is a lot more uh, specific examples um, to the policy. So I'm going to look at the one that's not redlined. Um, so if you're looking at the third bullet, for example, the third bullet identifies and explains the major non-national religious holidays that we're referring to and when they occur, um, which there has always been some confusion in the previous policy around that. Um, in the fourth bullet, we uh, give specific examples as to what teachers, coaches, and advisors should, re should refrain to, refrain from. Um, we also, in on the next page of the policy, we give examples, so on the top bullet of the next page, we give an example about um, if a student is absent from school on Yom Kippur and was assigned a long-term project. Before Yom Kippur, the project cannot be due the day of Yom Kippur or the day after Yom Kippur. So we have the statement, but then we also give a specific example. Um, one of the things that was brought up by the teachers in the group is that they, need, they wanted to see some examples so that they can understand more what um, some of these areas were. If you go down to the last bullet um, on the page, that page, you'll see that we give a lot of examples of what accommodations could be, not necessarily what they have to be, but what they could be. So this gives teachers an understanding of what different accommodations are and what they could do. Um, there is a bullet, and I have to find it. Oh, on the first page, I apologize. On the first page, the fourth bullet down, and then the last sub-bullet under that fourth bullet. Um, we did make a slight change in the policy to the MIAA um, events for athletics. We do have a lot of control over home events as to when we can schedule them. We don't have as much control over away events. Um, if a school does not um, have a problem scheduling an event on a religious holiday, uh, we don't have a lot of latitude in that area. So, or if there um, maybe, if it's a violation of MIA policy where you can only play so many events in one week. So this gives a little bit more flexibility to away events and um, adheres to MIAA guidelines as well. So really so the policy essentially, has... Essentially adding the comment and working with other school districts. School districts to schedule, yes, in accordance with MIAA policies and regulations. Oh, right. Separating out the, the home. Yes. Is there anything else? I had some questions, but I want to make sure you finish. No, I mean, essentially, it was really going into more detail, giving examples, uh, clarifying some areas, is what you see in this policy. So I know it was on the other policy, but it struck me when I 
or was on the, the policy, but struck me when I read it again is, is under bullet four or three, the last bullet, the superintendent while identify. So is that saying that the superintendent can add another religious holiday to the calendar without the school committee constant. So for this, for this part, so and that's that was in the previous policy as well. No, I know it was, and I guess I, you know, I'm not saying you, but right. that this policy goes <clears throat> on for whoever a superintendent is, and I guess I would want the superintendent to be consulting with the school committee before. It, he or she adds another holiday. Well, you the approve the calendar, right? Well, oh, right. So, so what I would be doing is recommending to you. You would approve the calendar yeah. that has that holiday. Oh, could, oh, maybe that should be denoted as part of this statement. That that, right? I see what you're no, saying. No, I mean right? we. Yeah. yeah, let me think of. I maybe okay, I. Right. Yeah, you're right. I know we do. Uh, right. I was just thinking that. Why do we even want to get into that discussion where we're? <clears throat> I, I think the reason why that's the there is that oh, the, we don't know what may. Um, it, it could be the change, the way the you know the community could change, and or there may be other holidays that we need to consider in the future. Um, so and that's, that's fine. I guess I just don't want the superintendent to say we're now going to have yeah. X holiday off without. Right, but that would, again, you approve the calendar. Dr. Doherty, though, it says at the, um, and communicate Sorry. them on the school calendar at the beginning of the school year. So I just wonder, but the, but that's really. That's after we, we've that's approved after, the right, calendar. It, it should, I wonder if it should just be t tied to the approval, that this statement should be tied to the approval of sure. the calendar versus the beginning of the school year. Right. Have it tied to the school committee. Yeah, I agree. Can I ask, is, is that? Yes. I don't get the sense that this is mandating action. It's just no. making teachers aware and and people aware of other holidays. I'll no. use an example. No, this no is, it isn't. This it's is, saying that he can identify. No, it doesn't mean that days would be off. No. What it means is that the policy for the accommodations would be followed on those other days. Right. So, but we would have right, to approve that. Right, but we'd have to. I I know. I know. It's not just days off, but if we're uh, I think we need to identify in the policy which days that the accommodations need to be adhered to and not start adding more uh, at the discretion of the superintendent of the superintendent right I mean that's what I'm right but, uh, I understand your concern and I will definitely put it in there but it would be your approval of the calendar that would be included when you approve the calendar in November, December time frame, it would be on that calendar. Right. It but I, I will clarify the, I understand what you're saying. It lists the, the non-national religious holidays that the accommodation policy applies right. to is, right. are listed on the calendar. Correct. Right, and we approve It's that. the calendar you approve but I has those right. holidays. Yeah. I think he should. I, yeah. Yes. I, I can give an example of where it might come up that the superintendent might make a recommendation for an adjustment. A couple of years ago, Eid was scheduled, the holiday Eid was on the first day of school for many districts. The whole, I'm sorry. The, the Muslim holiday of Eid was at, and this year it falls on the Friday that we have off. So it wasn't a conflict, but when you think about it, if there's a population that needs to celebrate that and you start school on that day, it might be that the school committee needs to consider not starting school on that day. But we would do that as part of our calendar approval in the November time frame for the previous year. Right. right. I wouldn't expect <coughs> anything to come up like that in the middle. The calendar is going to be set and we would know about that and it would be part of that process. Right, the impression I'm getting from this is that he would be aware of that and so before we start considering the calendar, we would be made aware of that and we would vote on it. We uh, would discuss as it. As part of our it. approval of the calendar. Right. Okay. Right. I understand so the concern. Just I, will, I will put in some language that hopefully mm -hmm. clarifies it. Point yeah. Nick. Yes. I, I, I have a number of concerns. I'll group them into three buckets with that. 
Okay. Um, the one real substantive concern I have is this. Um, I was very concerned and remain concerned about students feeling or being put in a position where they feel they need to identify their religious beliefs for taking advantage of this policy. I don't want a student to be in that position. The mechanism we have right now here, I think, is unchanged in this uh, policy. It's the last bullet point um, under, it's the last bullet point of the policy. To be entitled to these privileges, the pupil, student, must present to the principal a written excuse. I don't like that word excuse. Um, signed by a parent or person of standing, etc. So a parent or guardian, either 24 hours before or the day they return. I, I don't have issue with the timing, um, but can, can we revise this policy in light of the comments we, we generate today as a committee? I would propose that we soften that to allow it. There's a lot of different ways we could do this with the technology we have today, but basically all your communications are going student to principal here or parent to principal. And, and this is just, just for you to think about it as an administrator. It's, it's not really ours to dis decide how you would want to operationalize this. But at, at a policy level, could we have something like, you know, there's a sign-up sheet or something. If you're going to have this religious observant, parents can go in through the parent portal, check their kid off on the holidays that their kid's going to be observing, and generate the list for principals. The principals can communicate that to teachers. I just don't want students to be in a position where they say, teacher says, where's your homework? And they say, well, I didn't turn it in because I qualify for the, it could quickly turn into a situation where a student feels they have to identify their religious beliefs in order to not be in trouble with their teacher when they're surrounded by their peers. So I don't want that kind of. So just so you're aware, this is the exact language. It's in chapter 151C, section 2B. Right. And this is I, right out of the law. This is the law. I, I understand that. No, I'm just saying, so that this isn't, this isn't the Reading Public Schools saying this. This is and, the way it's written in and, the actual and, law. And what I'm saying, I yeah. just said I don't like the word, I still don't like the word excuse. Um, but fair point. My, my point is that can we say in Reading, we operationalize written to mean emails from parents to principal. It could mean some other way of logging in through the parent portal and identifying your child as being um, covered by one of these, uh, this policy, rather than this seems to, in my mind, um, open the door for the possibility where a student is in the situation I just so described, which I wouldn't be comfortable with. What, what if under the, the, the second bullet actually addresses this? And I, and I think <coughs> I, I can see your point, but I also look at, look at how do we execute the accommodation, how do the teachers do the planning for the accommodation if they are not aware of the situation. Well, so I, I think <coughs> in that's the second bullet on the first page, it, it basically talks about that and maybe it's this um, the, pro the the manner in which that that gets done. If we you know if we had the technology to use the parent portal, I don't know, but it just says they're encouraged to make a request well in advance, so that the teacher can do the planning. So the question is, what are the mechanisms to make that request so that it's not? I think what your point is, it's not me walking up to the teacher in front of my classmate saying I need this. Or, or a student saying, where's your homework? And they say, oh, I, I was out for holiday, whatever. Right? I, don't, I don't want a student to be in that position. And I, encouraging is one thing, but the, the policy definitely says there are some shall refrains in here, right? And, and so I, I just want to have the policy say something affirmative that students will not be asked to self-identify their religious beliefs in the interest of receiving you know, coverage by this policy. My could I ask, a, I think it's a clarification, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of that bullet is that it's not applying to all of the accommodations in terms of student work, but just to that particular section, that's a sub-bullet, because this, the schools by law have to take certain attendance records. Mm -hmm. So basically this section is saying, if someone is going to be absent from school, but essentially not have it part of the record, that that's gonna, this is the reason, and so that's what it's pertaining to, not about no, for, uh, assignments being right. turned in or things like that, but simply the legal attendance so records. What does the it, set forth above apply to it's in exactly, that bullet? Yep, yep. Yeah. It's does the set it. forth above apply only to the bullet that starts with district policy prohibits this? Yeah, and that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah. So that's a, I think numbering this I think might help. As a, as a, well, yeah, yeah, so, so the mechanism of operationalizing that last legally required bullet point could be 
something, you know, it's, it's, by law it's got to go to principal. I could envision a system where parents provide the information somehow in an authorized way to the principal. Principal generates a list, that list goes to the relevant teachers. The teachers know who's covered by the policy. The second, second point on the organization of this, I would find it helpful if we organized this by who. So if we had superintendent school committee will do these things. We will approve the calendar, the, we will identify the dates on the calendar that are eligible for religious accommodation policy and you know, <coughs> that's what we do. What do parents and students do? What do teachers do? What do extracurricular coaches do? So if each of those groups had a, in this policy, if you're a principal, this is what you do. If you're a parent, this is what you do. If you're, if you're a superintendent, this is what you do. Because it's all mixed up in all these bullet points right now. And I think if you're a parent reading this, it's really hard to know, well, what do I have to do and when do I have to do it? So that's one point, because you just kind of group all, all parts of this policy that apply to each type of person, each type of role together. Um, and the other thing that's confusing to me here is, is the scope of the policy. So we've identified five days in the calendar, but then some of these restrictions apply, uh, long, the long-term assignments and group assignments, that applies to that, that day as well as the day after. So many of these observances fall on Fridays. Does that mean Monday or does that just mean Saturday, which isn't a school day anyway? I don't know when I'm reading this. So it seems more reasonable that, you know, maybe it's logically I would think, well, if it's a weekday other than Friday, then it applies to the next day on the weekday. But yeah, so, so that's, that's a point of confusion. I think if we just identified a calendar and approved it once a year with these are the actual calendar dates that are eligible for this religious observance policy to take advantage of it, here's how you do, this is what the parents need to do. Um, that, that would be helpful. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of unclear to me is what does long-term assignment mean? What does group, I mean, group assignment is probably more clear, but is a week long-term, is three days long-term, is a semester long-term? I just, I think teachers and parents could, and, and students could interpret these requirements differently, and that could just lead right back to the discussion we started with about, you know, you know, my class had a project assigned a week ago and we didn't get the protection of this policy and someone else says mine was a, six months ago and we got, you know, we, people would have different interpretations of what long term means. So uh, again, I'm, I'm concerned about or the day after that applies to that. I'm concerned about what does long term mean. But long term could mean something different for for was different parents, subjects. Um, if I could, I, I think, I, could, I don't I, know. I understand a lot of the things you're bringing up, but that's not what goes in a policy. Well, it's here. We wrote it. Right, but the definition of all of those things that you're bringing up, those are, those are things that are defined in schools. And those are the things that are communicated by teachers. This is actually, the, the group that put this together, they were very satisfied with the specificity of this policy. I mean, you, you have to remember, this was a, a recommendation from a group of people that spent some time looking at the very things that we're talking about, and this is what they feel is the best uh, approach. I understand. If I could just um, add, yeah. it, it, but it is what, a school committee. Why don't you I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. So I, I, I'm not, I, I will, we'll do our best, to, I'll do my best to put something together that satisfies some of the things that you're bringing up, but I, I think, I think it's gonna, it's gonna actually create more confusion, but see. I was just gonna say, it is a school committee policy, and, okay. and ultimately it comes back to us. So I think we need to be comfortable with it. I'm not saying I necessarily agree with everything that Nick says, but I do think ultimately we all have to be comfortable. I do like Nick's idea of this is, this is what the principal has to do, this is what the teacher has to do, this is what the parent has to do, this is what the student has to do. I like that because a lot of times things can get lost in the shuffle, so to speak. And if it's very you know, laid out and the principal knows, he, he, uh, he has to notify the, the teachers of um, you know, the student, these students that you know, they're going to be observing these holidays, then there's no way around it. We know this has to happen and, and if it didn't happen that way, then someone's accountable. Because that's the problem that we've had is you know, it hasn't been adhered to in the past, to the best of my knowledge, to the extent it should have been. <clears throat> yes. I, I think along those lines, though, that's not the process that we have right now, and that's not the process that's described by the policy. And I think if, we're, if 
we're saying, some members are saying to change that, that's a, that's, that's a bigger shift than was looked at. And I'm not, again, I don't know that we have that process in place. I think one of the things that would be very helpful is just numbering it, maybe whatever the organization, but numbering it so that we can understand that specifically this, the part about the law, that those bullets only refer back to that section, not the whole section. So I think some things can be cleared up, um, but I think we have to be really careful. And, and maybe I almost wonder with what we're talking about here, it almost seems like at a policy level, this is, oh, it's almost too detailed. And I feel like, um, you know, there's, it's almost like we've got a process document here and if for, for the, where we're getting into with John, it's almost like with Dr. Dari, we should make it a little bit higher level. And he's and he has the process document, and that's not for us to get into the details on it. So I think, unfortunately, that you know, the, there's a lot of details in there. I don't I don't think that we should try to add more detail. I think I would say we we've got a crossover here between a policy and a process document. And that's why we're in this discussion. Yes. Um, two thoughts. One is I think that the accommodations policy as written gives the parent and the child a choice as to what they're most comfortable with. I think that if it were specified that the principal does this and the teacher does this, then somebody might not be comfortable with being on a list of all the Jews in the in the schools or whatever, it's a, on a more personal basis. So, the student, the parent, can approach the teacher, or if they're not comfortable with that, they can approach the principal. Says, and I think that that discretion is important. the The other thing I just wanted to suggest is that feedback from um, the town manager about um, a. a publication that was circulated in terms of information about the holidays. Um, the town manager pointed out that there wasn't information about the holidays going into the night of the holiday. So it's wonderful here that, for instance, it talks about the holidays beginning at sundown, but it doesn't talk about the fact that the holidays actually go into the evening, too, with a break fast after Yom Kippur. And so there were mistakes made in the past where town events were planned on the night of Yom Kippur, as an example. And people who are celebrating their holidays can't do that. So this accommodation policy actually with the day after included is really important um, because it acknowledges that people can't start their holiday, their homework on the night after being in temple all day. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but I'm wondering where it's explaining on the third bullet on the first page. Um, it, it talks about the holidays. It begins at sundown and it ends after the night after. So it's important to say that it begins at sundown the night before and, and goes through the entire next day and evening. Just for people's information, because if they think it ends, then they can plan a pasta dinner for a team on the night of the holiday. So you're saying the wording for Yom Kippur is not fully accurate? And, and Rosh Hashanah, right. So it begins at sundown the night before and ends then after the next night. I'm not exactly sure what the language should be, but it begins the sundown before. Okay. I, I, I will add in that there were three members from the Jewish community that were on this committee, and they actually worded it this way. Okay. I'm just saying because we've experienced that confusion with the town. No, no, I understand that, but that... Well, I, mm, so you're right. saying was the town using our document? No. They well, were. No, no, because this, they haven't, no one has seen this. No, but I mean, even prior. They were, they were using, I don't have it with I, me. I they think were we have using, to make sure that it works for us and it should be accurate, but maybe some discussion with the folks who gave you the input. I don't know. I just think it's an oversight. Because the assumption is that you would know, like on Easter, you'd know that it goes through Easter dinner. But 
on the Jewish holidays if it's not always familiar or assumed. So it does begin the night, bef the sundown before, which people don't realize, but it also goes through the next night. Yes. We would, yes. I had a separate question, but Linda, was there another point or in nope. addition to that? Or did Thank you. you. Um, two final, I think, points for me. One is, is just the, the reason why I, I wanted to make sure that we're as clear as possible in this policy is that it, it is an entitlement under the policy itself. So all students are entitled to individual accommodations for these dates. Um, and so that's why I want to be as clear as possible because it is an entitlement <coughs> for the student. So I think the details, the examples are really helpful and to include them as, and, and to, uh, I think it was Elaine's point, the, consider the possibility of having a policy and a guidance document or something with it to maintain the flexibility of the superintendent administering this and, and kind of saying to the school committee, here's the policy that I'm asking you to approve. Uh, here's the guidance document of how I would administer and that could have the specific example or something to, to go for to maintain administrative flexibility and make sure that you know, we're administering this in a clear and consistent way, but at the same time um, have a, a set of legal entitlements in the policy uh, that are as clear as possible, uh, a set of guiding principles for everybody. Uh, and, and the last point that I had was just all the discussion about specific holidays and when they begin and end, I think is a appropriate part of the calendaring process for the mm -hmm. school committee. And so that you, the superintendent could propose dates that are covered by um, this policy when we finalize it. Every year those would change as the calendar changes and some of these holidays move around. And there's flexibility there every year to, to be able to move those dates around, and, but, but we all agree on what happens and can't happen on those dates. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a conversation we have annually as a committee. Thank you. Yes. I just feel like I want to make I'm the chairman, one, not her. Yeah. Oh, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> Did I, I didn't say yes, did I? <laughs> one clarification, I think, to make sure that people aren't, I'm not confused, people at home aren't confused because we talked about process if a student needs to come forward or things that um, you know we, we, I, I understand that where the policy is talking about certain attendance issues or for students who might need some individual accommodation but for most of this and certainly for the the major non-national religious holidays identified nothing needs to be done by a student, I mean, this is, these are things that we're saying as a school district, mm -hmm. we are not scheduling things on this. Mm -hmm. We are not signing work on these days. Homework is not due on these days. And so, and that's true for everybody. Right. Is that? That is correct. Right? And so for those holidays, it's just not happening. It's not as if it's happening for these kids, mm -hmm. but not for those kids. It's everybody. We're just not scheduling things. And I just thought that might have gotten lost in some of the discussion that people are watching. So I just thought that was worth clarifying. I do want to go back to something Craig said earlier. That last bullet that I think was creating some confusion only refers to absence. That's it. And it is written that way in the law, Chapter 151C, Section 2B. But right. it doesn't tell you all the ways you could interpret written excuse. Right? It just has to be signed. No, my point is that bullet refers only to absence. Right. I, I think That's it. Right. What's confusing is that it says set forth above, which could mean the whole entire document, versus if you just number this. I, I understand as a that, section. and I've got I've got that information. Okay. And that's I think that would, I will definitely. Right. I, I just. Right. We can't take I that don't out. I want because to lose sight of the fact that a group of people yeah. who are very interested and concerned about this topic, three members of the Jewish community, in that group, administrators, teachers. Um, came together and put together a policy recommendation to you that they feel very good about and will help us move forward from some of the things that have been in the past not working. And it's still in the implementation. And that's fine. That we appreciate that input, but that doesn't mean that we just No, no, I know that. Say, I, I don't want it to lose sight of the fact that 
what's in here reflects things that we've already been doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, there were not drastic changes made. It was to clarify things that were in here. And some of it is law that we have to follow. And we'll find mm -hmm. out whether the, the lack of uh, uh, a, not adhering to the com accommodations was a management issue or a policy issue right. because I'm not sure uh, mm -hmm. that now, there was anything wrong Passover, with the other policy. There weren't any issues during Passover last April. Yeah. We worked, we worked real hard at that. We worked at some of the things that, that weren't working and we improved in that. Mm -hmm. We've got some Jewish holidays coming up in September. Any other? Yes. To your, what you raise is the last point here, the last bullet point that you were just talking about, to be entitled to these privileges, that one. So does the law allow you to change 24 hours advance notice to become the day they return to school? Is that allowed? If you're saying that the law requires that last bullet point and this suggests a change to allow notice that is after the fact is that permitted i'll have to check okay because that that we got to know right we can't i mean uh, i'm okay with the idea of students having and parents having the opportunity to, to submit their written notice after the holiday but not if the law doesn't allow us to do that doesn't that statement allow it well this statement does but that's not what the original policy said so we changed it we, we we're suggesting a change in this document the parent at least 24 hours in advance was the original policy, and we added, or the day they returned to school. Oh, so we just need to check the law, the, yeah. the wording of the law. We'll look into right. That. Okay. Let's Let us know. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. If you're outside From the previous version, then afterwards. Right. All right. This is going to be a quick meeting. Oh, we um, just actually, we have a... We're done with our agenda because we, yep, have, we have a, a right, um, move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective, collective bargaining and not to return to open session. Could I, could I just, under new business, before we get to that, I just wanted to add something that I think we should think about. Um, I got some phone calls. Um, wait, because, um, so. Well, well, some oh, I wasn't agenda. seconded, so fine. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I just, I just, the extended day program, I got a few phone calls um, from parents who didn't get into the program. I don't know the whole, I, assuming there's a cutoff date and there's also a space issue. So yes. I'm just thinking, I mentioned this before, but if we have um, the funding available and if we have the interest, I think if we could look at some potential ways to accommodate everybody that really would want to take part in it. Um, it is a service that I think is very valuable. The parents really appreciate it. And, um, you know, if we can rent uh, the, 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 a gym and a school and a, a church or something like that, I mean, or, or even space that, uh, you know, there's obviously there's a, there's a significant budget. And uh, I think that's something just to, to explore. I'm not saying we do it, but just to explore to uh, make sure that everybody has a chance potentially to be enrolled. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so um, move to enter into executive session to discuss <coughs> strategies with respect to collective bargaining and not to return to open session. Second. 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 Roll call vote. Yes. 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 I can't. Thank you. I can't be in. Thank you.